Test one, test two, test one, test two, one, test two open. We, we are, are live. We are live. One, two, one, two. Okay, we are live. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we are here in open and we are at 81st Street, at the Avenue, library. Uh, we're here to talk about the program and one of the generations. We got a lot of time. I'm going to go to the studio with a very live community board. And we also got a lot of time. We're watching this one. We're going to go to the studio with a very live community board. And we really quickly, I'm going to just give you all you want to do. And I don't want to be like talking because we're going to get to the studio with a very live conversation. We got to talk about it. With respect to California Federation and also California Federation Task Force, we have a, a super special guest today who really found out about the meeting yesterday. They decided to, to, to pull up uh, based on the public comments uh, that is Dr. Lewis, who is one of the California Federation Task Force members. I forget who shows um, shows uh, Mr. Lewis because he has a task force leader, the governor. Or the leader of the Senate, or the leader of the Assembly, but somebody chose him uh, and it was a good choice. So, uh, Dr. Devonta Lewis is going to be here. Uh, I don't know if he wants to answer questions or listen. Um, obviously, feel free to be asking him. Either put your phones on bar, things like that. Yeah, that's how I'll be able to. Yeah, so I'll get to the house. So, let me give you the overview. So, um, we're going to start. Someone, someone said in the chat it's a weird echo. It's an echo still? Yeah, no, we're the, the, the tech people got it to work. Um, but we got to go forward, right? Because um, y'all are here, right? Um, and this is actually really what it's about. It's really about people in Oakland. And that's why we got here. We drove down from Sacramento. Really to show the Oakland community some love. Um, so, just quick overview. I'm going to go through a few just basics around the California Reparations Task Force. There's some basic info. So that we all got the like baseline knowledge and then questions, comments, thoughts. I got some questions for y'all. I think y'all might have some questions for us. I'm sure you got some questions for uh, Dr. Lewis. Also, Created the California Reparations Task Force. There was folks like us, and I got I got to give a shout out to like Kevin in the in the back there too. Who Kevin? I don't know if you remember we uh we did some canvassing and some flyering yeah. the homeless people yeah. with reparations on the flyers back then. So I think it was like early 2019, right? Yeah. Um, so we've been at this. I'm I'm trying to say we, we've been at this since the beginning, um, and we helped get the law that created the task force passed. And now we're continuing our work, uh, doing two things broadly. Two, we have two general things that we're trying to accomplish. The first is we're trying to make sure that the California Reparations Task Force is open, transparent, and responsive to community voices. And then we're also trying to make sure that the California Reparations Task Force ultimately gets to strong re reparation proposals, right? Actually gets to real reparations that we can use and that actually get it done. So those are our two goals as an organization. We got a bunch of other different groups in our coalition. We got folks in San Diego and in LA. We got folks in Inland Empire, uh, San Bernardino. We got Oakland, Sac Sacramento, El Grove, right? So that's a little about who we are um, and why we're here and how we how we got here. Uh, if you want any more information about what we're doing, cjecofficial.org. Um, you can also check out etmmediagroup.com. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. So that's my short intro about who we are. If you have any more questions about that, feel free to hit me up. 
grab me after we're done, and I'm, and I'm happy to answer any other questions about who we are and how we got here. So that's us. Uh, let's go. Let's actually go into a little bit of the basics around California reparations and like actual reparations task force. But just some quick basics. I have one slide somewhere I think um, that'll be pulled up at some at some at some point. Um, but I want to change this around a little bit and ask y'all um, some questions and see if um, y'all can answer some of these basic California rep reparations task force questions. And that is probably a better way to do this, so we don't have to listen to me talking lecture for like 10 minutes. Now, some of the answers are going to be up on the actual screen. So, uh, but uh, my first question is, and this is again, basic California Rep Rep Reparation Task Force info is, does anybody here know the name of the bill that created the California Reparation Task Force? Only I think you can answer this. I think you know this one. Okay. Uh, does anybody know the name of the bill that created the California Reparation Task Force? Yeah, yeah. AB one three twenty one. AB thirty one twenty one. Yeah. So AB three one twenty one. So if you want to read the law, if you want to read the law that actually created this task force and actually see exactly what they're supposed to do, see exactly how they're supposed to work, see exactly how much time they have, see exactly what their jobs are, AB thirty one twenty one. Just Google it, right, and it'll come right up. The second question, this basic in info. Second question is, how many members are there on the California Reparations Task Force? Nine. Nine. Nine members, and we have one. Oh, now that now that answers are coming up. <laughs> yeah. So should we take it down? No, 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 no. You, 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 you. <laughs> Ask questions, see what we like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so can anybody tell me what? Is this California Reparations Task Force for what is what is their job? What are they supposed to do? And yes, the answer is fine. What are what are some of the things that, that they're supposed to do? Why are they here? Gather information, get the data. Right. Gather make sure, make sure reparations going to the right people. Right. Okay. Any other things? What like what else are they supposed to do? Educate the ones who don't know. They want to educate people who don't know about what's going on about California rep reparations. I got an education yesterday. Okay, uh, I got an education on Thursday at the last meetings, uh, and I want to talk to some of y'all about that because I learned some things about California over the last forty-eight hours that I didn't know, uh, and about how we how we do it us here. Um, so, but yeah. Share info. Um, any, any, anything else? What else is this reparation task force supposed to do? So generally, three things, right? Gather info, right? Gather, gather, gather data. Figure out a way to educate the California public, but also create a report. Create a report. Recommendations. Yes, yes. Now that's what we are most like excited about, right? This task force also, by law, has to create reparations proposals. So they have to design a reparations program for black folks here in California. And as a part of that process, it has to figure out who gets it, what do they get, when, why, where, how. Okay. All right. right, right. So that is that's generally the three general things. Now, if you read AD 3121, the law that created the task force, you, you're gonna see that there's a lot more in there. There's a lot of pieces to that, but generally, the task force has to do these th these three things: study, collect the evidence, figure out a way to educate the California public, um, and develop rep rep reparations proposals. Now, let me say this: I'm actually going to go off scripting a little bit for this one. Find ways to educate the California public, and actually for this one too: study and develop, study, study and collect evidence. Let me ask y'all. Did you learn anything this week, or what did you learn this week, if anything, that you didn't know about California and California's role in slavery and Jim Crow that, that, you, that you didn't know last week, let's, let's say? Uh, the KKK, the police in LA. Yeah, right. I was like, so our people ran from KKK just to find out they was here in law enforcement and, you know. Yeah. 
So Kevin is talking about, uh, so we had a few people come on and testify to give expert testimony at the California Reparations Task Force hearings, the third hearings, which were held over the last two days, two day hearings. This is the third time that they've met. They met once in June, they met once in July, and the third meetings were over the last 48 hours here in September. The next meetings are in October, and then there's a meeting in this December too. Um, but during the last 48 hours, we heard a lot about California, especially what um, Kevin is saying, that uh, at some point there were about 3,000 KKK members here in California, and 70% of them were in law, law in, in enforcement. Okay. Uh, here in California, right? You know, I think down like the, the LA area. So that's, that's I, didn't, I didn't know that. I think I learned that even though California was a free state, they still had uh, slavery here. Right. And uh, I learned that. Yeah. So, I, I so think we all learned We're not as liberal as, I mean, California, for sure. Everybody said black people went out west to get away from the racism, but it was here just as well. Yeah. So what um, what Kyle was saying is that we call ourselves a free state, but we had somebody testify, John, Jonathan Burgess, who we actually work with, and we are very lucky to work with Jonathan um, back in Sacramento. Uh, one of the Burgess brothers, he has a twin brother. We don't really know which one is which, to be honest with you. <laughs> one of them is running for Senate, so kind of, kind of, kind of what saying, the other one test, test, testified yesterday. Maybe. So, the, but John, Jonathan Burgess is a direct descendant of one of the first black families like, to come to this place I'm pointing this place because he came, his family came here before it was in California. They came in 1849. They were brought here enslaved. Okay. I think his family was also then re enslaved, sold back into slavery here okay. after buying their freedom working in the gold mine. He was then resold back into slavery. Okay. Um, heavy, right? Heavy. Um, and I, I, I gotta be honest with y'all, you know, usually I'm more energetic, but I have been going through it over these last 48 hours because I didn't really notice. And I didn't really, you know, this is like, this is a lot to be taken in, right? So, um, yeah, we're learning a lot. Any, anybody learn anything else? Am I thinking right when I say that the first governor of California was a slave He, If he wasn't a slaveholder, he was an arch racist. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was a su supreme white supremacist, the first governor of California. Um, yeah, um, right, um, Peter Burnett, right? And don't get Dr. Amos um, Brown started on Mr. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> okay, okay, they talk about Dr. Amos Brown. Yeah, yes, yes. One of the things that a lot of people don't know about California that was not mentioned here, um, California, of course, has the largest membership of Ku Klux Klan. Over time, they obviously changed the name of the organization. They're still one of the same. And obviously what sparked them to come here was because of the gold rush. But one thing that's very interesting, not just California, Southern California in particular, but the Bay Area. So any of us who are born and raised here or been here long enough, when you're going up 80, where you have the um, racetracks on the Berkeley side, yeah. then you're going up... Um, right. Those condos, those apartments before you get to that Albany exit, before any of that was there, that was actually nothing but, you know, the Bay Area was nothing but farmland. Yeah, land. That particular area is where they used to gather and have these. Mm, yeah. I learned of this several years ago, I think it's on the History Channel. I don't even know if you can find it. They actually did a documentary about the history of the Kuba plant and happen to mention that particular area. Mm -hmm. So when there are people here who happen to visit, and my mother is from Mobile, Alabama, born and raised. So she's lived here all my life. She relocated a year ago. When her sister came here the previous year, we happened to drive through, because our family migrated here to go to Richmond. And I pointed that to her. For somebody who's from the deep south, who's in Jim Crow, it is unheard of of California with the same association. And when I point it, I said, you see those right there? Wow. And she looked at me, she said, for real? I said, yeah. And so every time, I think it's when we learn a little bit about our history, you cannot remove what you learn. Yeah. 
So yeah. every time I pass by there, I'm like, that's where they work. That's right. Shana, Shana is right there, um, and there's a particular, um, so when you go back in, so by the way, ETM Media and our team, we live stream every single one of the California Reparation Task Force meetings on YouTube. And so if you want to see the ones that happened over the last 48 hours, you can go check them out on YouTube. The ones that happened in July, you can check them out. The ones in June, we're going to do it in October, we're going to do it forever, right? The, uh, but I, I believe it was, Stacey Smith, who was one of the expert testifiers for the last 48 hours, I think she was given the, she was basically spilling the tea about what California was a, was about. One thing that I learned um, was that California, the California Supreme Court set the precedent for the Dred Scott case. So I don't remember the Dred Scott case who said that basically black people don't have no legal standing in this country. We can't sue, we can't do anything like that. Right? Good. Um, so, like, that was at the federal level, right? Black people don't have a right to sue, don't have a right to go to court, but the California Supreme Court actually set that, like, set that, in, set that in, in most, I think it was like a case called Perkins or something like that. Uh, and I think a black, black folks tried to like go into that like, court and sue, and they said, there's no such thing as um, you suing. Um, you don't have a right to go into court. Um, there's no court for you. Three years. Right, or less. I mean, that's zero, right? Like, if you can't sue, if you don't have a right to go into, I mean, you don't have no, nothing like so. Uh, that's one thing I like. Um, so, a little bit more basics, right? Um, let me ask um, who, um, who was a part, uh, or do we know who was, who chose the members of the California? California Senate, so I think that's at that time it was uh, Tony Atkins, and then um, the leader of the California Assembly, who I think is Anthony Rendon. Um, so those are who the people who are uh, chose. Um, and maybe one more question, just basic stuff before we jump into the real conversation here. Um, how long, uh, when does this task force end? When does this task force work? And how long do they have to do their work? 2023. 2023, so they have at least, uh, they have until, or they have at most two years from the date of their first meeting. So we that means, have, but we want Gavin to do executive. We want, executive. we want, we want whatever to happen to happen now. And let me ask you, stick, stick, stick on this point. So they have at most two years to do those three or four things that we talked about before, right? They have at most two, two, two years, but. They can do stuff and propose stuff and put out reports and put out recommendations and design proposals for reparations now. Okay? They can push those proposals out now. Okay? Um, it's not a uh, it's not it's a good thing that we have two sitting legislators on the actual California reparations task. So we have a uh, Senator Stephen Bradford and uh, Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer. So we have two sitting leg legislators right now on the on the actual task force. So, uh, and then we have obviously have a government, so they can do stuff whenever they're ready. Um, you know, maybe Stephen, he was like, "I'm about to call over here." Right, 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 right. And there's this, this, like this stuff that, that that can that can happen now, right? Like there's um, this stuff that we can see before, you know, right? Be, be, before the end. Now, let me give, let me ask you guys one, 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 one more just basic question. Um, how many meetings? Does will this task force have? How many meetings by law? Who, who, who said 10? Yeah, 10. So at least 10. At least 10. Oh, 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 I'm not getting out of shot. So at, at least 10 public meetings, uh, at least 10 paid public meetings. The task force members can meet over and above those 10 meetings. And part of what came out of the meetings in the last 48 hours and also the July meetings is that. 
the task force can actually do what are called listening sessions too. So I think they're going to be at least 12 or so. I hope I'm not messing that up. But at least 12 listening sessions. So where task force members come and do actually what Dr. Lewis is actually doing today, uh, listening, uh, just hearing them from, you know, black folks. So that's over and above the 10. Okay? So we're going to have at least 20 times to interact with each, with each, with each other. Uh, and they can still do more if they if they want to. Just be, before I, I, I wrap this part up, you can actually reach out to the California Rep Reparation Task Force now. Uh, they got an email address. They got a number you can call if you want to leave a comment right now. You can do it right now. Also, CJEC, we are helping to collect comment and submit it to the, to the task force. If you want us to take your comments to the task force and submit it for you, we happy to do that. Um, so, all right, that's um that's all for the for the basic stuff. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts on the just the basics? Any basic questions? Let me ask y'all a basic question. What is reparation? What is that? What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Restorative justice. Re repair. Restorative justice. Restorative justice. What does reparations mean? What are we talking about? Because we we saying it. <laughs> what are reparations? Right. So this uh, I'm gonna give you some ideas that we use, but your ideas are the best. Yeah. So generally speaking, when Rep reparations are done in other parts of the world, and they are done in other parts of the world. But they've been done many, many times, okay? and in this part of the world too, and here, except for us. Uh, we use uh, five. There are five general forms that some people talk about. Oh, there we go. We on point. There are. I wouldn't even plan on this side. Kim is on point. Uh, <laughs> there are five general forms of reparations. All right? Generally speaking, okay. So. Compensation. Cut the check. I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, compensation. This is a this is like the financial piece, right? Uh, if you ask me, and I think if you ask a lot of us, if you don't have compensation, it ain't reparations. Okay. And I say that to myself over and over again. Okay. So that got to be there. Restitution. What's restitution? Though? What about rehabilitation? What's that? Satisfaction. I'm going to be satisfied. Guarantees of non-repetition. That's kind of clear. Right? Clearish. Right? Don't do it again. So I'm just putting these ideas out there. All right? We're not going to get all the answers in, in that. I just, just want to put this on your spirit because um, this is how we talk about reparations. So, so when somebody asks me, what do I mean by reparations? I'm talking, I say, well, I'm talking about compensation, uh, restitution, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition, specifically to um, uh, black folks who descend from US slavery. Um, and there's a, if you can see at the, at the top of the slide there, um,
did watch the meeting. Um, just some general thoughts. What were your general thoughts, um, general impressions of what you saw? Anything at all? Anybody want to talk? There was a lot of good information was provided. Uh, there were some very touching stories regarding what happened to different people, you know, pretty much similar stories that we all have, you know, the different things that our ancestors encountered. And then basically the last thing that is having on us currently. Right. Um, when I heard the story of Burgess remorse that his family is losing, you know, I think it had, you know, their land taken. Yeah away you know after all the stuff that we already had to go through to get just a little bit you know to still have it taken afterward you know um so my family lived you know in the, in the 1940s in Oakland my, my grandmother was a, a sharecropper as a child in Texarkana Arkansas so when I moved over here um they pretty much you know had to try to do extra just to get anything they, they live where the, where the post office is you know, down, you know, wow. downtown Oakland. So they just built, you know, stuff right on top of where their whole neighborhood. You know, so that's something that happened throughout the United States. Yeah. You know, and you know, to see that they actually owned, you know, the land and they had it taken away and it was just covered up like it never happened. You know, like a lot of our families have experienced that and you know, education itself won't prepare that. You know, the, the wealth that was stolen, you know, there's there, there, there has to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to go more. Yeah, yeah bro. basically, the, the, the land, you know, you, you can't completely repair it that way, but there has to be some type of financial compensation so that we can actually acquire wealth, you know, so, so that we can actually, you know, put our families in a better predicament. You know, they had all that generational wealth to transfer to them. You know, we need to have something that can help communicate. <laughs> Help grow for our family down in the future as well. So yeah. Well we got so we have we have an example of we have I'm gonna get to the other two right with any, any anyone else who has questions or this feedback from the meeting. But um SD seven ninety six, I'm gonna put that on your on your mind. So SD seven ninety six, that's the bill to give the Bruce family their beach back in LA, right? Um, so LA took California took Bruce's beach. From the Bruce's family, uh, and I believe it was the 30s or 40s, um, and we just passed a law last week and to give it back, to give them their beach back. Yeah. Okay, I'm going down there. It's gonna be a party. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to get out there. Okay, it's like it's just a beach, it's a resort, right? You know, um, and we took it from them. Okay, they took it from us. Let me not say that. Okay. Um, so. The, the, the Burgess family is another example of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're lucky because they have they have records. Mm -hmm. We don't all have records. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Bro. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, they set up another mic right now, so I have to uh, uh, <laughs> leave this area. So, um, any other anybody else watching me and have any thoughts that that they want to share on the on the just general thoughts, general impressions? Yeah. So I read this with an immense, an immense, an immense cat. And I also feel like in this climate, we have to understand that our enemies are here among us and working against us. So that's why it's so important for us to really push hard for reparations and just educate people and just understand that we have like a like major enemy out there. And also I really just want to take all of us, we don't want to Look at the commission as a monolith, so there's going to be different ideas. But I hope that we can, you know, come together because this cause is going to benefit all of us in this long term too. And one last thing, we need to watch out for the Department of Justice because they are a part of the commission because of the parliamentarian um, things and uh, roll call and whatnot. But we really have to be mindful and um, check them when they're out of line as they try to um, change the agenda for the commission without even mentioning it to yeah, the commission. To the commission. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that we make sure we let the Department of Justice understand their role in, their, in this commission, which is not to take over and have it their way, but it's our commission. So I'm glad that they address that like 
right as soon as it here is done with him. But I really, really want to be mindful that we have a tremendously majorly unfriendly enemy out there fighting this commission, even as it's just starting to take off. Thank you for that, Carol. Um, I got some thoughts on that, and I do want to get, um, have to let you guys also you know, um, ask any questions of Dr. Dr. Lewis, too. But uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on the meeting generally? Um, we just brought up the California Department of Justice. Uh, they are, by law, and I want to give you some background here, by law, the California Department of Justice is in charge of, um, and Dr. Lewis will probably explain this better, uh, but their their job is to administer and carry out the will of the of the actual task force. So their their job is to help the task force do what it needs to do, right? basically. Um, but as we learned <laughs> as we learned yesterday, and I'm just going to keep it real. I said we learned yesterday that the California Department of Justice changed the September meeting agenda without telling the task force members. Okay, um, we we learned that yesterday. Um, uh, I want to, yes, yeah, uh, Sean, you have any? That's okay. I'm just curious, is there any consequences to that? So for someone who actually sits on the board, I'm president of the board, something totally different from this, we have a management company that works for the board. So they're not to, you know, there's a resource and a tool, so forth, but they are not to control. I'm wondering if that's the same concept of this partnership because if you're there to make sure xyz is done whether it is that you're physically monitoring it does not mean that you own what is going on and i'm wondering if obviously we know there's intent and, and sister here come out enemy we have open enemies for everywhere right I, I think and, camilla, and that's part of it i think camilla addressed that when uh -huh. she said uh Word for word, but she was like, they was able to, if it was a problem, they can have a rule on it. So maybe, uh, Dr. Yeah, Lewis, yeah, so right. I'm yeah. just wondering what is the real consequence in terms of what is written on paper, not assumption. So, if someone does not fulfill their duties, he or she should not be in that position. And can they be replaced? Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I would love to hear Dr. Lewis's thoughts on this. I want to put two ideas on you. Two right now. First, I should have said this in the, in the beginning, but you really do. We've never done this be, before. Yeah. There's never been this type of thing in American history. Nope. This is the first make state preparation task force in, in um, American history. Okay. And you are part of it. Okay. Um, these are the first ever community meetings for a state reparations task force. Okay. And so I'm, I'm saying that's a little groundwork. I'm going to lay something on top of that right now. We, we, we don't have any playbook. The NAACP can't tell us what they I did what do you want me to do? in this case. Like, the Urban League can't tell us what they did in this case. We are writing the script right now. Let me lay something on top of that. One thing that we didn't know we would have to face is the question of how much should one of the institutions and organizations that is a part of the reason why we need reparations in the first place, how much should they be a part of the actual process? Okay, don't the California Department of Justice is the state's law enforcement arm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how much should they be a part of this? They are part of why we need this. They are part of the harm. They help harm us. So why and how much should they be a part of this process? And we've never had to ask this question before. Because um, we've never done anything like this, and I hope the people who are going to watch this, who are working on the national reparations bill (HR 40 and S 40), um, the one in the House and, and the one in the Senate, I hope they're watching this now or, or will watch this because this is a question that they're going to have to deal with when the federal government does the big reparations program, which they are. Yes, go ahead. Uh, stand on the DOJ. The several, uh, several of the uh, call-ins, and I agree is that they won't even monitor or claim they don't have the staff to monitor a chat, which is really, um, are they just doing this to us? Because in this technology, this is the way we communicate. So they're taking that right away from us because they don't have, quote unquote, the staff to monitor. I'm not buying it. Um, Thank you. So Darlene just brought up another five points. 
Uh, so this is the second thing that we learned. We actually knew this already, um, and we've been working behind the scenes on this. Okay. Uh, by, by, we, I mean, the CJEC team, we have the advocacy team. We've actually met with the California Department of Justice. I'm not sharing anything that's not public. We have met with the California Department of Justice twice already directly. Okay. Um, uh, but Darlene just pointed out that in addition to changing the agenda that the task force set for itself, which to me, I can't still even wrap my head around it. Um, they also disabled the comment chat in the actual like meeting. So like, you know, I do log, log on to a Zoom meeting, you could be in the chat. They cut it off. They cut it off after the first meeting in June. We didn't have it in July, we didn't have it this, this time. And their reason was that they didn't like some of the comments in the first meeting. <laughs> Somebody didn't like some of the comments. That's basically what it boils down to. So Somebody they, didn't they like had, some of the comments. So they had the chat on the first day. The first meeting. And then they said somebody said something. The first meeting back in June, they had a, the chat on. Some so <laughs> obviously there was some type of moderation. Look, I moderate groups. I've been I've been moderating groups professionally for almost 10 years. I I'm I'm, my largest group that I moderate has 30,000 members. Um, I'm a dude that has 10,000 members. The I don't understand the we don't know how to we can't moderate a chat question. Um, but obviously there was some type of moderation because somebody read some comments right. they didn't like and then decided to not remove the person to cut everybody's voice off. Okay. Um, they also didn't tell the task force members that, that they did that. Okay. So, yeah, help me out, thoughts? <laughs> okay, because we are not happy about this. Um, this is, um, I've never seen, uh, so here's what I've never seen, I, and I'll, I'll share um, my DOJ piece here. Um, there was a point in the meeting yesterday when the task force members were questioning the Department of Justice representative about why did you change this uh, uh, agenda and why did you cut off the chat without telling us? Um, and they were they weren't answering the questions. Um, and there's and there's one point where Senator Stephen Grafter. Could we probably do one show? Well, hopefully not. But it, was, it, it sounded like they didn't. It sounded like they didn't know. So the 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 Senator Stephen Grafter, who's on on the, on the task force, asked one of the representatives a question directly: Do we have? Are we in control of our own agenda? Uh, and there was no response, and not 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 like a not like a, a a bad answer or no answer. There was literally no response, literally quiet. Okay? I've never seen that in my life. All right? I've never seen. I was saying it before. I've never seen a, a city senator make a question of one of the task force members. Oh, should be one of the one of the representatives, and there'd be no answer. Now I assume that. The so I in, in in my mind the DOJ rep representative was not paying a, attention, uh, and it was clear that the person was not paying attention because we are watching live. The person is on their phone. Well, she yeah. made some like rebuttal that uh, they're there to work together or something. That was so they they circled back and asked the question again, and then the answer was uh, it was a it was a standard it was a non-answer okay? and. How was the PR mode mm -hmm. to cover his or her whatever? Mm -hmm. and, and, she, she, and she kept texting on that phone. So was it emergency? <laughs> then you take the video off of you to do that. You don't do that in the session. You wouldn't have done that if the governor said we need to have a meeting or any kind of state. Right. 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 Yeah, that, I'm, I'm just sharing. I'm just, again, you know, uh, my, my, my role, I'm a. Uh, I'm an organizer, but I'm just a black person like y'all. So I'm just giving y'all my role. Look, my we were all on code that day. Yeah. I, 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 I think you're right. Um, so, um, hey, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. More people coming. Uh, so, uh, any other thoughts on the meeting? Anything else stick out to you in the actual meetings that you saw yesterday or the day before or maybe even in July or, or June meeting? Anything stick? 
Yes. One thing I kind of like to see you guys on is the idea of the meeting times, okay. which are during the week that they were asking me then about having on the weekend, Saturdays. and more working people could possibly, you know, um, oh, sorry, where people could more easily attend the meetings and contribute, and there seems to be, I mean, I'm sure it's possible. Like, the, the government has so many ways to manipulate, you know, people hours on how they schedule things. But they seem there seems to be some uh, pushback on that, which is making it, you know, easier for the public to comment or even learn about the commission, the task force's um, jobs that they're doing. So that kind of concerns me as well. Yeah, Saturday meetings. So we're doing a Saturday meeting right now, right? Uh, isn't this a little, I mean, for most of us, this is better for our schedules. Not everybody. Okay. Um, uh, we have some comments coming out. I'll get some comments in a second. But yeah, that, right, right there you go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, and we have some comments on the, on the uh, screen here. Um, you know, and I think people are, you know, saying the same things that we're saying, right? Um, but you're, you're right, Kyle, the Saturday meetings, right? So this was a, this has been talked talk about, right? The task force has been meeting. During the week, uh, and so what's up with the Saturday meeting? What's up with the weekend meetings? Right, that's that's more accommodative for Black folks' schedules. Um, and there was resistance to that. Okay, um, you know, and I don't think that's something that they should be resistant to. I'm just giving my own thoughts here. So uh, the Saturday meetings, and then also the meeting time. Now, one thing I do want to say, that I want to ask y'all questions. One thing I do want to say is that I want to give a shout out to the regular Black folks who have been, you know live streaming the meetings and you know doing community work canvassing and doing all kind of work has to bring this to black people uh, but one of the things that we were fighting for and we actually got and we see it happen is that like we asked for the meeting to be made longer so that more people could come and actually like be a, be a part of it like to move the meetings from one day to actually two days so if you missed it the first day you could come on the second day if you missed the second day you could come on the first day um so that's one thing that has happened and also now we're going to have these additional listening sessions also, like I said, on top of the 10 meetings. So I'm assuming there will be actual scheduling of that on like a Saturday or, or you know, something that's better for our schedule, even if it's like, a, you know, I think somebody says it's a 5 to 8 p.m. or something like that, you know, something that's after your normal-ish work hour um, or after you've got to go get the kids or after you've got to go to school or after you've got to make dinner, right? I mean, we got real black people lives. You know what I mean, um, there's no. Uh, I am very lucky. I get. I, I I work from home. I'm very very lucky. I can sit and listen to the whole meeting all day, and also do my do my work. That's my boss probably listening. You know? So I'm doing both. Okay, I'm doing both. But I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I know. I know how lucky I am. Uh, and it's not that many people like that. So, but uh, one question I have for y'all. Um, how do you think, how do you want, like, how should this task force reach out to you? Like, what's what's ways that it should connect with you? Like, should it be putting up billboards? Should it be door to door, you know, going door to door, knocking on the door, leaving door hangers? Should it be on your radio? I think, I, I think billboards, commercials, uh, flyers, every promotion. Right. Every way, right? Any, any other? I mean, that's good. Uh, I think also, um, the task force should probably reach out to the different organizations that are actually in place currently. Um, I think NAACP, you know, see Jack for sure. Um, but basically, then, like, should actually reach out to the members or like encourage them to inform their members so that they can participate, like, you know, in these, in, these, uh, in the actual event so that they can, you know, call in and know exactly what to do so that their voice can be heard. So. Yeah, yeah, Darlene, yes. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank the ETM group for everything that you guys are doing. You guys are always right on time. Give a round of applause. Give a round of applause. And also, after, uh, to the task force, you know, even though I do have some issues, I think they're doing a good job, and I think they're seeing that their hands are being yeah. tied. But what I do like to talk about is the community outreach. Because when it was on the agenda, I actually pulled out your work because I thought, oh, okay, this is what, but credit to Dr. Jills. It was a fantastic um, presentation. I need to look at it again. Yeah, but when she was 
presenting it, I felt like, okay, this kind of sounds, it felt like to me, those uh, Nielsen ratings, where, where do they get this information from? I've never been involved in a Nielsen rating. So I felt like it was removed from the community. And I'm not saying it was because I need to listen to it again because it was very detailed. And also, like the brother said, uh, definitely you need to be, uh, this group needs to be an anchor for that. So I'm Thank going you, to email actually the task force to Thank remind you. them of that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so, what, yeah, thank you. And, yeah. the, so, the lady talking about community outreach, uh, she, she mentioned that uh, we actually have been asking Black folks for months now the same question on online, offline, the community has asked the same question. So, we actually collected those answers and collected those responses, put them in a nice little PowerPoint and send it to the task force and say, hey, this is how the community is saying they want you to talk to them. And we're going to continue to do that. And that's why we're asking the question now, too. As Darlene also was saying, the there was a community engagement plan talked about at the last at the meeting over the last two two days. A couple of things came out of that. Uh, one was the listening sessions, right? So now we got these listening sessions, good, good, good. But one of the other important things that I think is something that we got to talk about is like, oh, okay, let me let me just ask. Name a group that you are connected to. Like, name a, a group or an organization that you connect with that you you know are are a, a part of. Yeah. Uh, Berkeley Arts. I mean, Black Arts Movement and Business District. Black Arts Movement and Business and Business District. Okay. Any other organizations that you are a part of? I'm part of the Political Action Committee. Open NAACP, Blue Action Committee. Anybody else a part of any organizations? Allen Temple Baptist Church. Allen Temple Baptist Church. Any other organizations that anybody's a part of? So we have 15 reparations over everything. Oh, we, there you go. <laughs> right? Well, we got 15, 16, maybe 20 people here. The, maybe about four or five of us said we are connected to some organization. Okay. So 20%-ish, one in five of us, so 80% of us don't have an answer. Right? So one thing that we got to think about is uh, in the plan that they talked about at the meeting, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it looked like it was built, and I want to go back and read it more too because I was coming in late and I had, we've been doing a lot over the last two, two days, so I got I to gotta, I gotta go back and look at it. But one of the things that it looks like is that they're going to set up the community engagement plan and like have one um, they're going to use the U UCLA Bunch Center as like the organization in the middle to like help coordinate all the other groups, and then they're going to have groups connect to the UCLA Bunch Center and like to, to to do the community engagement work. So this group might be a group that works with brothers and sisters locked up, so they're going to connect with them. This might be a group that works with the youth. We're going to connect with them. This might be a group that works with the, with the churches in the mosque. We're going to we're going to connect with them. But as we just showed. If the rest of black folks are like us, we may be hitting 20% of black folks, right? So one of the things, I said this in my comments, one of the things I think we want to think about is how do how do, how do we want the task force actually go directly to people, right? Because the groups are going to be good, but the groups ain't going to get us all we did. So how do we actually go directly to people, right? Uh, should, should the task force rent this, should the task force members themselves just rent something like this out and go directly to people and put out their own promos and all that stuff and bypass groups. Yes, the groups too, but don't just rely on the groups, right? Because a lot of black folks ain't connected to groups uh, and I learned that the hard way. You know, like, you know, I think we all learned, right, you know. So, um, all right, I wanna stop there. Um, uh, I do wanna just give you, give Dr. Lewis the opportunity to say uh, some words if he wants to and also give you an opportunity to, to talk to him and ask him some of those same questions. Uh, so, uh, if we can, um, I'm going to, okay, so um, how, about, how about this, we're going to take a five minute um, break, right, okay, so take a five minute break, um, let's, let's, get, let's get some water, and then we'll shift a little bit, and then let's come back and let's have a conversation with uh, Dr. Lewis, if he can say, all right, um, big shout out to the YouTube stream, too, what's up, Friday, I see you, what's up, Citizen Edge, Friday, John, we see you, Hey, can you put the comments back up? Let me uh, let me see uh, who's in the um, comments chat. Yeah. 
What's up, Anita? What's up, Ronnie? What's going on, Citizen Ed? I see you, Citizen Ed. We gotta hear some Second Amendment proposal for you, man, from uh, for our reparations. Uh, Kimberly, I see you. What's going on, Labor? Oh, LA born, DC love. What's going on? I see you. I see you back. Um, okay, so we're we'll back in about five minutes. That one is around the corner too. We can hear him, but it was um. You had to turn up my. I had to yeah, turn, turn up my up. audio. Yeah, do you got? Do you want to practice now while we're? Yeah, right. cause I don't. I don't know if it's something on. Wait. On can you just hear us? Maybe. <laughs> just to confirm, I can hear everybody. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you look like. I mean, the only thing that I can think of is to break, uh, to leave YouTube is to do it without breaking the stream because we don't use play some music. Oh, that's on there right now. Yeah, that's up there right now, but I'm sure they can hear everything we're saying. Do you want to share my screen? I could play like. Uh, I mean, but you have to take the HD and live. No, I could share my screen and play something. You know, just play my screen. Try it. But I mean, I'm just. Hopefully, Dr. Lewis will be able to. Um, we can hear him. That's the only thing. I mean, when I have my audio, and probably everybody can hear everything we're saying. But, um, I mean, I'm just trying to figure because I don't know if it's in your settings or if it's in my settings. Or, no, that's probably why we need more than five minutes to set up. And <laughs> so I don't know what it, what do you want to do? Do you just want to pull up your YouTube and play something from yesterday from the stream? But it's not going to go up on here. But it'll go out to our audience. Yeah. Should I, should I do that? Well, what, what is this? This is that's the camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it's showing. That's my camera. No, I'm sure. I mean, do you just want me to go play some videos? You're gonna have to share your screen. My, I mean, my screen. All I have to do is take off the brand. No, I'm saying like, we're gonna have to, if we're gonna play, like, let's go. Let's just be. I'll just tell the phone. I'll just go fade. All right, so here we are at the uh, Poor People's Campaign. And uh, we're speaking with, uh, do you mind saying your name? Please? Sure, my name is Faye Wilson Kennedy. I'm one of the co chairs for the California Poor People's Campaign. All right. Our proposals uh, that, that some of us have said in terms of uh, reparations, we would like to kind of see that, in particular for black people who are saying for reparations and slavery. Do you think that might be something that could be put into like a reparations proposal? Sure. So, like a housing trust fund where people. Uh, can tap into it. So for right now, example, at the end of September, the uh, renter's moratorium is going to end. We're going to have thousands, if not millions of people nationally, uh, particularly in California, that's going to be, if, if they don't get help paying their rent, they're going to be out on the street. So a fund should be set aside where they could be able to access to help them when they need it, whether it's one time, whether it's, you know, so many times per year. There also money could be set aside to help people with down payments for homes or even, can you imagine, because when people move into a new place, you pay the first and last month rent. So if your rent is $1,500 a month and you have to pay the first and last month, you're looking at over a thousand. You're looking at over three thousand dollars just to move in. Most people don't have that kind of money because they're not, they're working minimum wage jobs. They just don't have it. And if they're a parent with two or more children, that means they're looking at trying to find a house or an apartment with at least two or three bedrooms. So you just add that up. So in terms of 
terms of the homeless population here in uh, California, would you say it's uh, disproportionately? Uh, so sure. So in California, there's more than 160,000 people that the government will acknowledge, and the, about 40 percent of those are black folks. Uh, and it has to do with systemic racism, those policies. We're first to be, we're last to be hired and first to be let go. We're not making enough money to sustain ourselves. Okay, can you, I know you briefly mentioned about uh, housing isn't affordable. Um, since, I guess, first of all, how long have you been living in California? I've been living in California since 1964. Okay. Mm -hmm. So since you've been living here, was there any point of time where you felt like housing was more affordable? So, so for example, housing was used to be affordable in Sacramento, where people could afford to, to you know, to rent for a while, save up money, and then go after the American dream to buy a house. It's become unaffordable for most people now. So if you were to bring the black share of wealth at least to the black share of the population, it would require an additional at least $10 trillion. Amend the Mass Media Group is California Capital's premier YouTube channel focused on reparations. Dedicated to political advocacy and apologetically aimed at shining a spotlight on our righteous justice claim for reparations. Tune in to ETM Media Group YouTube channel Tuesdays at 9 p.m. PST. We do show intro, show outros, voiceover, script, copy, 15 and 30 second promos. Check us out at etmmediagroup.com. That's etmmediagroup.com for more info and updates and to get involved. I don't even know what you're doing. I don't know. And it's good. We're back. We're back. Uh, we are, we are going to get back started, y'all. Um, and what I want to do now is just give, it, give one, maybe we give Dr. Lewis uh, a few minutes to just talk a little bit about, share, or share any thoughts that he has. We talk a little about his background and like how he got here to like the actual task force. And then, any questions you have, I hope Dr. Dr. Lewis will, will be uh, happy to answer. All right. Um, I, just, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Lewis, for doing it. Give it a round of applause, please. All right. So, uh, the brother found out about the meeting yesterday, okay? And he's still here. All right. So, I want to get a better yeah. shout out. Um, so, Dr. Dr. Lewis, when you're ready, take it away. And yeah. Sh sure. Hi, everybody. How are you? Can't really hear. You can't hear me? Can you hear you? It's real, it's real low. Give us a second. Okay. All right. Good. All right. You are you are good to go. How about now? Am I good? Coming through clear? Good. All right. Wonderful. Well, listen. Thank you for thank you for the work. Um, everybody for being there today. Um, you know, <clears throat> this is this is proof that you know we could do stuff on the weekends, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and listen, I, I'm not, you know, we're not supposed to be speaking, you know, for the task force when we show up individually. Um, so I'm not. But what I will say is that it's, it's very clear. And I think what I, what I heard from the, the conversation that you all are having today is that you're recognizing that the task force is willing to put the work in. Right. And I can just confirm that we really are really willing to put the work in. Right. We, you know, um, you know, mentioning the extension of the meetings from one day to two days, we were happy to accommodate that. You know, we're happy to 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 accommodate you know weekend meetings if we possibly can. And so we are running into a you know a few um, administrative problems. And you know, I would I would recommend everybody go back to um, AB thirty one twenty one and look at Article five around administration administrative provisions, and that will tell you kind of you know why we are running into a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, so for example, uh, <clears throat> Article 5B uh, says that, 
the task force should have the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Department of Justice. But there's a lot of space in that statement, right? Um, so, you know, Camilla and, and Dr. Brown are working really hard to try and get that relationship um, smoothed out. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 is, it is difficult because, as you know, the Bagley Keene Act prohibits us from talking uh, to each other, you know, in, in any group that's larger than basically one on one. Right. Um, so it's difficult for us to communicate. It's difficult for us to kind of share our uh, views on things collectively, you know, outside of the meetings. Right. And there's a lot that we have to do. And we shouldn't really be spending, you know, task force public meeting time, you know, working out the nuts and bolts of how to meet and how to actually get an agenda put together. So I think, you know, we are we are hopefully going to you know work with the DOJ to get things smoothed out. Um, but Article five tells you exactly what you know, what our, our scope of powers is in terms of the administrative provisions. Now, you know, I, I, I wanted to come here today. I, I just picked up yesterday, you know, um, that there was a meeting today. I was hoping to be there in person, but I'm, I'm beginning to feel a little unwell. So I just didn't want to, you know what I mean, put anybody at risk. Um, so, but this is exactly what, what the task force wants, right? This is exactly what the task force needs, is for community members to come together and to actually make the claim, right? And, you know, we are very much driven, you know, by the public. Um, you know, I think there is an effort, you know, so we're talking about the, the length of the, of, the, of the task force being two years. You know, the view is that we will take the whole two years because you know, we want to make sure that we get representative information from the public, from the community. Um, and, and so, you know, right now, I am primarily focused on, on getting us to actually identify, right, the community and to actually put it on record, the communities for whom we are working. Um, you know, I am trying to get us to put on the record, you know, what the task force members respectively meaning individually believe reparations are um it has it hasn't been said right and so you know i think i'm showing up here today because i want i want to at least you know um in addition to kind of hearing a little bit about what you all are thinking about what your you know what your hopes are for the task force you know i want to make sure that you have a chance to to ask me questions to understand where i stand um you know it's one thing that I am very curious about, and I'm going to see if we can do something about it, is that we have these public comment sessions, yet we can't respond. <laughs> you know, you all are asking questions that we can't answer them. And so that's something that I find very frustrating. And so, you know, if there were public comments, you know, that were made um, and you want some kind of response to them, you know, if I can, I'm happy to take that opportunity and do that right now. So by all means, I'm here. I'm here for your purpose. Um, and so please let me know, let me know how I can help and let me know what I can answer, answer for or, or about. Thank but thank you, for, thank you for having me. And in the future, please let me know when you're having more, you know, I have a small son, so I can't travel very far, um, you know, but let me know if, you know, when there are future events in, in, in the Bay. Um, and I, I want to make sure that, you know, the Bay Area voice is represented and, and I'm happy to show up any weekend um, in the evenings. Uh, to any of your meetings. Uh, but I appreciate that. Um, I just want to let folks ask questions. So if you do, um, who wants to start? Robert. Hello. So um, I had a couple questions. Um, one of which being the vetting process for the people who are selected as expert uh, witnesses. So, uh, what was that? Yesterday or the day before, we had Cam Howard, uh, one of the members of his cohort, come on. And he seems to have a very good grasp of the socio historical understanding of why reparations is needed. And so, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. But as soon as he came to his solution, he kept on going with that evidence in play. And that's not something that I'm happy with. From what I understand, that's not something that many other people that were in the chat was happy with. And so the last thing I want is for something to gain traction that, you know, many of the advocacy groups are not happy with. And so, and so I was just wondering, like, when we propose who's going to be an expert testimony or expert witness, 
of what is the, the criteria people are using? Do you know who nominated him? Can you tell us that one? I cannot. <laughs> you know, I mean, and this is and this is what I saw yesterday. You know, um, when we were talking about the agenda for October, um, and there were some names for. Uh oh. You pro. We're good. I think we lost Dr. Lewis's feed. Uh, we'll get him back in a second. Let's ask Dr. Lewis for his contact information. Yes, um, we definitely want to do that. And just just while we're while we're getting Dr. Lewis back, by the way, great great question. Um, yeah, great great question. Just give him a round of applause for that question. Because, uh, uh, and so, does anybody know what we mean? Like, what are we talking about, Everson? What is that? What is that? What's what's Evanston? Why does that matter? Um, the the housing voucher that they're calling reparations. So we're talking about Evanston, Illinois, right? Uh, the city of Evanston, Illinois, has a a reparations program going on right now. Uh, and what Robert is saying, I think, what a lot of folks have been saying, folks in Evanston are saying that they're not happy with it. That is actually people in the black community are rejecting the reparations program. Okay. Now, why would that happen? How how uh, do you have to what do you have to do to make black people not want your reparations program, right? Um, and that's the question. So uh, Robert is asking about why uh, one of the I think one of the folks who was helping to to design that program, uh, you know. What does it mean when that person is going to be speaking to our task force? And and uh, I think you're talking about a frustration or a fear that that will be something, you know, right? right. Yep, somebody said it, right? Yep. Uh, and if you want to know about that Everson plan or program, you know, you can, it's all over social media, it's all over Google. Uh, we can just Google Everson Illinois Reparation and you'll see what the, what the, what the plan is about and like, what people don't like about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, no. I think another thing too to add on to what this brother had asked is also with the expert witness or witnesses is that them understanding what reparations is for Black Americans because we already know some of us who've been associated with another group of folks about the history of this in Cobra and how it's for everybody. And some of the argument we both have been about Terracom. So you don't want somebody to come into this space not fully understanding and having the intent that we're talking about people who have been enslaved on this soil, not in its diaspora, no other planes. And so we know those other conversations have been about other folks, but they do not bring us into their conversation. And so I think the one representative who knows how he really feels compared to who he's representing, that we're talking about us. And your intention when you're speaking to us is about us 100%, not 95, and then the rest of us, you're talking about somebody else in the back end. And someone's looking at you as an expert witness when, in fact, you should not be. And wouldn't that also tie in? Because they have not, unless they did it the last 15 minutes yesterday, I had to read, have specified who the reparations is for. I mean, we don't have that yet, do we? As in, as in Dr. Derrick's book, it's very clear. But we have not gotten that yet. And I think that that needs to be done ASAP. Let's talk about that real quick. So we're talking about who are reparations for? Which black folks? Isn't that one of the things they were saying was taken out of their agenda? Right. Thanks. Oh, so they actually okay. were trying to discuss that to be specific, but it was taken out of the agenda, and that's what they, they weren't aware of. Yeah, that wasn't happening. So we got Dr. Doc, Doc Lewis back. Let me know when we are ready to get him back on. Um, can, can you hear me? Thanks for coming back. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, there's a power outage in my building. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so uh, I had to wait for the Wi Fi to reconnect. Um, 
sounds like you were having a very interesting conversation, which is something I want to talk about. Um, I, yeah, I'm sure. you know, we you know what, what kind of black folks, but let me finish my answer um, to the brother's question around the witnesses. So, you know, it's 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 kind of unclear right now um, how people show up. Um, there seems to be uh, there seems to be a, a kind of approach where the DOJ is approaching particular task force members for recommendation. The DOJ also has um, a set of researchers who is doing some of that kind of work. Um, sometimes those names are then brought to the task force or specific task force members via email or, or, or phone conversation to, to kind of, you know, get us to, to vet them. Um, so for example, the economist that we selected, um, Dr. Dark Hamilton, he, you know, I had a conversation with the DOJ about, uh, you know, a, a series of, of economists because my background, um, is in economic disparities and so forth. They came to me. Um, but as I was saying before, before um, you lost me, uh, you know, there is an economic racism, uh, sorry, uh, an environmental racism uh, topic that was being proposed for the October, October meeting. And there were two, you know, two very qualified academics who were being recommended. Um, but, you know, I work, you know, I am the chair of a geography department. We study environmental racism in my, in my department, in my discipline. And I was surprised that I wasn't asked about that. Um, you know, while those two people would be great, you know what I mean? There are other people who I think would be more ideal. So, you know, what I think is happening is that, you know, we are being communicated with on um, a basis that seems to be determined by, I think, both the chair and co-chair and the DOJ. Um, you know, the, the, the chair and co-chair um, have the ultimate responsibility for, for finalizing the agenda. Um, and, and so, you know, as a as just another member of the task force and not in the in in, in the the chairship positions i'm not exactly sure exactly you know how some of these names are, are are being brought up so for example i wasn't fully aware of all of the witnesses until the agenda was finally sent to us um you know some time ago so you know i think what we what we do need is is a um you know greater transparency greater communication but the the challenge is that it's all being filtered through the DOJ, right? And I'm not trying to, you know, <clears throat> we have plenty to talk about in terms of, <laughs> right? but what I'm saying is that like, you know what I mean? Like, so there are, there are structural problems, I think. And a lot of that has to do with Bagley Keene, right? It's, it's the, you know, the fact that I haven't had a normal human to human conversation with any of the task force members to me is frankly a problem, right? Like, how do you, how are you being tasked with, you know, trying to, to reckon with, you know, 400 years of, of, of injury, um, you know, over two years in a group of, of nine who you haven't met, right, who you don't really know anything about. Um, in other words, you know more at, or as much, perhaps even more, because I know some of you know a, a couple of the task force members personally than I do, right? I never met Dr. Amos Brown. I've never met any of the other task force members. So it is a challenge in terms of getting to know who people are. Moreover, to me, I want all of our cards on the table as soon as possible, right? I don't want, want to know just who you are. I want to know what your beliefs are. I want to know what your politics are. I want to know what your positions are, because these things are going to show up ultimately in whatever we put forward. Um, and that's the, you know, and, and that's the issue. And so I think there was a, was there a discussion about, about the, about uh, the kind of qualification is that is that what what I walked into or came back into? You, yeah, you, so you walked into uh, so part of the discussion continued there. Maybe some folks want to ask uh, I don't know, I don't know, I want to ask your question or, or maybe Darlene. But let me ask you, let me ask you, um, Doctor Lewis. You know, in your perspective, let's talk about getting the cards on the table. So, who do you think reparations are for? Which group, which group of black people do you think reparations in California should be for? Right. You know, so I, I think you all call 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 yourselves Eidos, right? I mean, this is this is this is very clear to me, right? There is, you know, let me let me say a little bit about my own my own background, my own research, right? There is a a question of reparations that I have been asking in my research. Reparations has been a thing that I have been thinking about since I was a teenager, right? That has everything to do with well, what does it mean to be black? Right, that is at the heart of my research, 
right? What does it mean to be black? What does it mean to analyze the kind of histories and the processes that comprise blackness? We take for granted what blackness means, right? We take for granted the kind of qualifications of who qualifies as black, yet we understand that it's a very complicated thing, right? Now, when we're thinking about when we're thinking about reparations within the context of the United States, right, then we are deciding that the kind of root of reparations, right, is the experience and the consequence of enslavement on African people in this country, right? Meaning what we're talking about is that there is a point, there is a point that slavery in this country produces which makes a particular what you call lineage, right? That is different than other places. I am Jamaican, right? Now, when we're talking about the when we're talking about reparations for slavery in the United States, a Jamaican has no claim, right? That's very evident, and that's not even a controversial issue, right? Now, what we are thinking about is well, if slavery is the what well, let's call it and people call it the original sin in this country then we understand and what my research has been on in in different contexts different different geographies us and jamaica has been the ways that that original that are not original sin right but that original practice that original you know what is that economic and political right moment and how it continues to be reproduced, how we see various iterations and how black folk within these geographic contexts continue to make themselves and remake themselves within the context of those circumstances. So what I'm saying is this, is that if we're talking about reparations as rooted in slavery, Right? And we're saying that that act of slavery that we're discussing right, is in the United States. Then we are talking about right, what you would call as Americans descended of slavery. Right? Now, that is not controversial to me. Right? What I am not saying and what I do not believe is that nationals of other countries right, or people who are descended of nationals of other countries who are black right, have a claim. And let me explain why. Right. Can I go back to where I could see people? Because I'm looking at myself. And that's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like I'm talking to myself. And, you know, if I do that, then, you know, um, maybe I'm working too hard. Now, now, now here, uh, I, I, want, I want to be clear, right? Like, I am a Pan-Africanist, right? But what does that mean, right? That means that there is a basis for solidarity of all black people, all African descended people across the world. That does not mean, right, that we have the same political claims, right? What that means is that, you know, descendants, descended Africans, right, in Jamaica have a particular political claim that they could make, right, to the Queen of England, right, to the British Parliament. That is a very clear lineage of what we call a claim of injury. Right, African American people, if I can just use that term broadly, meaning Americans, right, who are black, whose ancestors were enslaved in this country, have a very specific claim of injury. There is a process of citizenship making, of, of, of claim staking, that has been a long part of the, the history of African Americans in this country. Reparations is a part of that. So when we're talking about when we're talking about reparations for Californians, right? Black Californians, right? I mean, this is a, this is where I want us to start having this conversation, right? What does that mean? And I asked I asked Isabel Wilkerson on the on the on the meeting, at, you know, yesterday, you know, as a as a person who studied you know migration, I wanted to know what it meant to be a Black Californian. How do we qualify that? And she never answered my question at all, and that was fine, right? But, you know, and this is where the community is going to be really helpful, right? So you talk about Mr. Burgess, who was on the call a couple of days ago, who's a fifth-generation Californian, right, black Californian. And then in a public comment, we had some folks who were saying, well, we think that, or the person who made a comment said that, you know, you should be, right, Eidos, having been a resident of California for five to seven years. Yeah. What we yeah. have is... <laughs> Was that? Was that? Was that you? That was me. That was you. Okay, good. Right? 
And I wish I was there in person with you. I mean, because I, I, I want to I wanna figure this out because we have to be specific, right? I mean, this is what I understand AB 105 is all about, right? Actually getting to the particularities of what it means to be Black in particular context because there is a need to have that kind of accounting. Right. So to put to put to put to bed any kind of, you know, kind of because listen, I get it. You know what I mean? Maybe I look like this, maybe I sound like this, right? People are like, you know, what's a Jamaican dude trying to do, right? <laughs> but I want to remind people, Shirley Chisholm, Stokely Carmichael, right? James Weldon Johnson. These are all Afro Caribbean people who fought for African American rights, right? These are all people who wouldn't qualify, right, as Edos, right, who fought for, right, the rights of African Americans in this country. So, but to put to bed any question, you know, I, I have two principles, right, meaning putting the cards on the table, as I said earlier, two principles, right, the qualification, Edos, reparations, first and foremost, cash, right, those are my two principles. And these principles don't just emerge out of my politics, they emerge out of my research. Right? And I can, I'm happy to talk to you more about that. But the brother in the back had a question. Oh, no, I was, uh, what I was saying is like, uh, I'm a native here from Oakland, California, right? So my birth certificate has the California stamp on it, right? right? Uh, and what I was, I was trying to implement is, I want that on there. I want you to have the same, because I share a California nightmare that somebody that lived in Chicago that's tried to come here just because they hear about the California reparations, you didn't share this nightmare that I had. I've been right. shot five times. I've right. been to prison two times. My cousin got killed on this street here where we're at. So, um, and I was saying, at least be a resident uh, five to seven years if you don't have the, the birth certificate. Uh, right. And, and this is and this is what we have to actually work out. Right. Because reparations, you know, reparations, you know, here, here's here's my thing. Right. So I wrote a book. Right. Called Scammers Yard. It's about it's about lottery scammers in Jamaica, criminals in Jamaica. Right. Who are saying that their crime is a form of reparations. And also for the record, I'm not saying that I believe that it is actual reparations. There was a comment in the public comment yesterday that I think was asking if I believe that somehow scamming was reparations. No. But here's what I talk about in that book. Is that there is something about living, right, with injury, as you are talking about, brother, right, that is foundational to how we identify and locate blackness. Meaning you don't have to just identify the act of being shot at or right the act of being harassed by the police right the injury doesn't exist in those acts the injury exists within your capacity as a black person to be always vulnerable to those acts right regardless of what you're doing i'm a professor at one of the top universities in the world right trust me so the point is that when we, you know, in my, in, my, in my book, right, I'm saying, well, listen, we have to understand that when you're living with the constant possibility of injury, that means that injury is all around you. That means that in a way, repair has to be just as capacious, has to be just as open. Because what we don't need to do is we don't need to walk around having to qualify our sense of injury as black people, right? You don't have to be able to be asked, right? To qualify why you deserve reparation. Your life alone is the declaration of your deservingness of, 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 of reparation, right? And so what we need to do though as a task force is we have to figure out, okay, well, what are the parameters Right. Well, who are the groups that we are talking about or who is the group that we're talking about? And the truth is that, you know, that answer really shouldn't be coming from us. That answer should be coming from the community. And it's a really big it's a really big problem. Right. It's a really big question. Right. It's an intellectual question. It's a cultural question. Right. 
So, you know, for, for, for me, you know, I, I like the idea of, okay, well, here's a, here's a, here's a, a you know, a, a, a parameter, you know, be resident, you know, be right. Be born. I don't know if you're saying to be born in this country, but to, to be descended of, to be descended <laughs> of enslaved persons in the United States. Right. My wife is African American. Her folks were her ancestors were enslaved in in Georgia, right? Our son was not born in the, in the United States, though, right? Our son was born in the UK when I was over there doing graduate graduate school. What I want to know is how do we work out those particularities? Does my child have a claim, right? As an example. So the point is that in a general principle, for me, right, it is clear, descended of enslaved persons, African enslaved persons, right? Because there was some, some kind of conversation about indentureship. I don't know how that came up. <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about that, right? But be descended of enslaved African persons in the United States, right? That's the definition. Now, when we start asking questions about California, right you know we have to look we have to look to injury and injury and, and and the kind of qualifications of injury so you're talking right now about right about uh violence you're talking about violence at the hand of the state we're also talking about generalized impoverishment right earlier you talked about bruce's beach right you're talking about acts of dispossession i live here in berkeley right we're talking about the the, the dispossession of south berkeley as a black community right with a robust com you know black commercial district for the purpose of building and that was dispossessed for the purpose of building the bar system right mm -hmm. so we have to have an accounting of all of these forms of injury and then we have to on that basis be able to 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 you know identify people right who are fitting within within the parameters of those of those of those moments those that 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 era right now that's something that i have expertise in that's something that i have done with my own research right how do we qualify folks but again it has to come from the community so you know i i, I really hope right they i really hope that you know the the community engagement plan is as good as it needs to be because we're going to need information from the community, right? About like, okay, fine. So, brother, what's your name? In the back, I can't, I can't really see yeah. him. Kevin, Kevin. Kevin, right? Yeah, Kevin, Kevin. Okay, all right. So if Kevin's saying, all right, five to, five to seven years, you know, the seal of California on your birth, on your birth certificate or five to seven years. Okay. Well, let's actually think about that. Right. Let's actually think about that and how how do we actually take that back? Right. We have also an issue to think about, which is the fact that California's history has been so violent that it has right expelled people from the state. Right. You talk about being in Oakland, right? Where you in, in fact you have satellite communities that are of Oakland out in Pittsburgh, right? Out in Vallejo. So we have to be able to track all of that. At least that's what I want to do. Yeah, I'm getting fired uh, from here to Sacramento. Right. Right. I mean, and that and that's and that's exactly right. You know what I mean? So, you know, and so that's what the task force can do, right? And that's going to be, I think, one of the one of the the lasting kind of impacts of the task force's work is how do we create a model for 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 accounting, right? How do we create a model whereby we can actually identify, right, communities of deserving, but also how do we do the important work of actually updating our understanding of what it means to be black, right? I mean, that's what I'm so fascinated. You know, I know CJ is working on 105, right? I'm so fascinated by that because yeah. that's important work. <laughs> that the Lewis, if I could say, say a word about that, actually, just to, just to fill folks in, um, so Dr. Lewis is mentioned another bill. So we talk about one bill, right? AB3121. That's the bill that uh, creates this task force. But there's another bill that is actually on Gavin Newsom's desk, on the government desk right now, right? that we, we've been working on. We, we got it through the California Assembly. We got it through the California Senate. 
It's AB105, AB105. Uh, and what it does, it does a lot of things, but one of the most important things it does um, is for the first time, I don't think anywhere in the country this is being done. It, it asks and makes and requires the state of California agencies, boards, and commissions to finally create a space, a way to collect information for black folks who descend from US slavery. Okay? Right now, there's no way in America right now, I think that you can go to a city government, state government and say, how many black folks from US slavery, descend from US slavery do you have in your district? You can't ask that question, or there, there is no answer to that question that I know of. Or I, don't, I don't know where it's being asked that. Um, so that's what Dr. Lewis is talking about right now. And this is something that, again, is on Gavinism desk right now. Okay? If you want, you can reach out to the, to the governor via email or via uh, phone. We have all that stuff for you. Uh, we have a script for you. Also, we're asking Governor Newsom to sign AB 105 right now. He had October 12th to sign AB 105. They would help the California Reparations Task Force in its in its work. And one thing I want to say just real quick uh, is I think it is, I'm really glad to like have a space where we can talk to somebody who is not from not you know, a black person who descended from slavery in this country, right? And and hear somebody like this say, yes, the, re the reparations is for y'all, right? Uh, because, you know, I don't know what's been going on over the last couple of years, but a lot of it I don't like. Whereas as soon as we see a brother or sister who's not from from us, it's, it's a potential suspicion, or maybe they don't want us to get reparations, or maybe there's a fight, right? Um, it's good to be in a space where we can have a conversation with somebody who is not a descendant of U.S. slavery in this country, but who is still fighting for reparations for us and in the lines of the Shirley Chisholm's and the James Logan Johnson's and Johnson's and, and many others, right? So I just want to say that one piece. I'm talking while I'm not supposed to be talking. <laughs> oh, <question. Yeah. laughs> you know, like... When we think about black power, you know, we're, we're here in Oakland, we're here in the Bay Area, and we think about we think about the legacy of the BPP and the slogan "Black Power," and that slogan came from a Trinidadian, right? Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, right? And and so like the work is the work, right? And I think you know that's my, you know, my religion is 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 freedom and redemption, right? And this is me from 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 ever since. So you know the the point is that there is, you know there is a very a very logical and necessary process for claim making right that uses lineage that uses descent as a primary principle of organizing and accommodating and tracking right injury and reparation my investment in terms of the very long political horizon is well what's the next conversation that we can have right so when Eidos, right, have reparation, when Eidos decide what together, right, if together, right, is going to come of reparation, when the CARICOM nations, right, get reparation through the CARICOM Reparations Commission, when these independent black communities in their respective geographies, right? Have more than freedom, right? And not freedom on the cheap. And, and there's another principle, right? Reparations is not the 14th and 15th amendment. Right? Reparations is, 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 is accounting for the injury of slavery and all of the following dispossessive acts of violence by which black people in this country, by whom I'm talking about, right? Edo's people, right? have facilitated the development of the United States, right? I talked about the BART system earlier. Sorry, BART, right? I know it's a, it's a, it's a cardinal sin to put the before BART. I know. Um, but when you, think about, when you think about BART, right, and you think about the Black communities that the development of, 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 of the BART system, right, the cost, and you think about everyday people moving, Right, being able to go to work, generate the economy of the Bay Area, right? Then you have to understand and you have to fully recognize, right, that the the the, the kind of productivity of the Bay Area's economy is quite literally, 
right, built upon the dispossessed community of black people, right? When you talk about Ashby Bart Station, literally on the geography of a black community of South Berkeley and the capital that is able to be facilitated. We see what's happening across, across Oakland, especially right, with gentrification, right? There's a continued price that black people in this country, African-Americans in this country are constantly paying for the United States and California's continued development and progress, right? And that is just economics. That's not politics. That, that's just that's just straight economics, right? So anyway, you know, my hope is that once we can accomplish these multiple fronts of, 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 of reparations causes, right, we can have another conversation later, right, as respective Black communities across the West. And, you know, perhaps, you know, I don't know, right, maybe with, 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 with brothers and sisters on the continent. But yes, lineage matters, right? This is how we actually get the thing done. That's not even a question. Um, let me, real quick. So real quick, I do want to, um, are there any other questions for Dr. Lewis while we have him? Um, just curious, do you have my brother Robert? Yes, sir. Um, I just kind of wanted to um, get clar clarification on a statement you made earlier. Um, right now, it seems like the relationship that we're having with the DOJ is, is tentative at best. And so we're not really uh, trusting them to do the right thing. Um, and if they could, uh, you know, basically cease our ability to talk in their chat room, do you know if they have the ability to void some of the uh, witness speakers that you guys are proposing? So, like, let's say the community has speakers that they absolutely want to see. And they may say some quote unquote inflammatory things would the doj try to stop them from appearing on the task force to you know give their uh give, give their opinion. so you're talking about so you just just to just to clarify because some of it was a little muffled but um so you're, you're talking about the, the 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 chat the chat moderation through through the app that we're using Right, so if the DOJ can, you know, keep us from I mean, typing questions into the chat, could they also, uh, you know, keep away a speaker that the community wants to see on the task force? Do you know if they have the veto power to do that? Oh, right. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So you uh, so, and, and are you asking about them serve, standing as like a witness, something like that, like actually coming and testifying? Right, or, or you know, expert uh, witness, somebody that the community wants to see, and do you know if they can keep, you know, no, we don't like this person, so we're not going to allow them to come. Right, so, so from how I understand it is that, is that, you know, we are, we as a task force have the power to determine who shows up as a witness, right, as an expert. That is our job. That isn't the DOJ's job to determine who those people are. But what has been happening, I believe, is that there's been a lack of proper communication by which we are being allowed to actually vet or allowed on regular on a regular basis um, to nominate people for these positions. So, for example, I haven't been asked, OK, who should you or who do you think we should have talk about these these issues? Right. What I'm hoping we remedy as a result of yesterday's conversation, right, with the DOJ and the little fracas that came from the conversation with the DOJ, is that we, we have greater transparent, transparency and, and greater communication. That's why I remember Lisa Holder, right, was hoping to, to, to actually be effectively have oversight, you know, over the creation of the agenda. Now, what has to happen is we have to make sure that we have a very clear um, conduit of communication from the community to the task force, right? That we know, we know how to have you all get in touch with us. Right now, that's the do. That's through the DOJ, right? Right now, that's through the DOJ. But what I'm saying is that we are at the very least going to have these kinds of meetings, right? So if 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 CJEC reaches out and says we're having we're having a meeting next week Friday, what have you, and folks are showing up saying okay, well, here's who we want to have in the conversation, then, then we know, right? So 
but to but to to, to answer the question, no, the DOJ is not going to have veto power over who shows up as witnesses. Right? But the problem is that you know I think we we in our first meeting we kind of got off you know with the the kind of you know the cart before the horse, right? So for example, while I'm very happy with with Camila and and with with, with Dr. Brown. Right, we we had to vote on chair and, and, and co-chair without really knowing each other, right? We didn't know anything about each other, and that was one of the first orders of business. And you know, a lot of us were like, Well, okay, we felt like we had to, to vote. And you know, I wanted I wanted Camila as as chair because to my mind, she was one of the best representatives of the community whom we were hoping to serve, right? And that to me was the basis, but I knew nothing more than that, right? Um and and that was you know and that was you know I, I think the first instance of the DOJ effectively leading leading the you know leading the the kind of structure of our meetings and since that first meeting you know yesterday was only the third meeting so let's just say that we've had two meetings right discounting the first meeting so we've only had two meetings where we've actually been able to start doing some of this work of negotiating with the DOJ about how things are run. My hope is that by the next meeting, we'll have a much clearer and much more representative sense of, uh, of the community and of especially the task force's uh, preference in terms of the shape of the agenda and the content of the agenda. Uh, an example is, you know, representative, I'm not representative, <laughs> member holder saying, well, listen, you know, Javan in the first meeting wanted us to have the conversation about, right, which community, right? Who qualifies? I wanted that conversation to be one of the first things we discussed. Because if we're talking about ADOs, right, then we have to actually understand the circumstances, the ambitions, the aspirations, right, the injuries of that community. That has to be a part of the very DNA of our thinking from the beginning. Um, and thankfully, you know, member Holder said, well, listen, next meeting, I want us to have this conversation. And so we're going to do that. So I think what you're going to observe over the next meeting or two is that we are actually going to slowly regain, you know, full control over the agenda um, and over, you know, over its content specifically. Um, but, you know, what I would say is that if you have people in mind, I would email the DOJ. The, the, the DOJ is required to pass along all communication to us, right? The challenge is that I think we voted a couple of meetings ago on the kind of the, the regularity by which we are given that communication. And so I think we may need to we may need to shift that to a more regular form of communication because what's happening is that sometimes we get this kind of massive download of the voice the voicemails that you all send, the emails that you all send. And sometimes we don't get them early enough to actually kind of think about to then make our own uh, you know advocacy for inclusion in the next agenda. Any other so I had just wanted to ask. Um, can you hear? Can you hear that? I, I can. I'm beginning to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there any, a way we can pre uh, prevent like racist? Tropes like Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> We're gonna buy Nike. You know, like this. Um, like we, we've seen through history. I'm pretty sure you're aware of this. You know, the Red Summer didn't happen because we used our money on, on Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma didn't happen because we used our money to buy Nike. You know, when we get money, we, we build communities, we change the world. You know, and, and that's the reason why these type of things happen. Is there any way that we can prevent these type of things from being created? <laughs> Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure we're not going to invite Larry Elmer because we're talking about it. Like, we have to deal with this on a regular basis. We don't necessarily need it. Our action, you know, like an event that's actually trying to get reparations. But I just wanted to ask that. I know you, you know, you're going to have complete control over it, but is there anyone we can try to limit that or someone can step in and actually say something at those moments? Yeah, you know, what I can tell you is that we were all appalled by that reference. <laughs> I mean, and, and listen, you know, listen, you know, and, and I don't know, I don't, 
I've never met. I've never. I never met. You know, uh, Mr. Brooks. I don't know anything about him. I, I again, I didn't choose him. I don't know how he was chosen, right? As a as a witness. Um, you know, I don't know how we could have prevented. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, and it wasn't a I see Friday Jones in the comments is saying it wasn't a Chris Rock joke. Um you know, I remember the Dave Chappelle skit from the Chappelle show, right? And um you know and I and I reference I actually referenced that skit um in my in my book because you know reparations isn't about you know reparations isn't about creating ideal citizens right reparations in the way that we're talking about it is is actually accommodating the injury that african descended people in this country have experienced right it is up to the community however you all define it to determine what you want to do right with reparation which is why i primarily believe in a cash based you know reparative uh, model Right. So, for example, reparations is not more education. Right. Mm -hmm. Reparations. Right. Is not access to housing. Right. Because what we know is that, you know, members of the white American community got all of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. Outside of any parameter of deserving them. Right. Especially on the basis of some kind of harm. You know, those opportunities, education, housing, etc are meant to be, you know, the kind of rights of American citizens, right? And that was meant to be sorted with, you know, the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. So that is a separate issue from reparation, right? To simply give, you know, you know, black people, in this, African-Americans in this country access to higher education as reparations is reparations on the cheap, without question. That is your right as American citizens, right? to have access to education, to have access to healthcare, to have access to these things that other communities in this country have had access to, right, without having to endure centuries of oppression, right? Now, what, what you know, we will learn from the community what an ideal reparations model looks like, right? That has to be community-driven. It has to be community -driven. You can't leave that to nine people, right? As one of those nine people, I don't want to decide for you what reparations looks like in some kind of vacuum without direct feedback. And so the responsibility of, of, of community events like this is to actually think very hard. And, and I'm glad that the question was asked, you know, what does reparations, you know, what does reparations look like? You know, what what would, you know, and, 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 and Camille and a couple of, of the other task force members had asked these questions of some of our witnesses uh, over the past two days. And that's important. But they need to come out of out of you know out of you know a kind of collective uh, working out reconciling at the community level. What does right the American descendants of slave community want as reparations? Now, going back to your actual question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have no. I, I was. You know, but in a way, you know, in a way, you know, you're surprised, but not surprised, right? I mean, and that's part of the issue that we have to work out, right? Is that, is that, you know, a part of the reason why I wrote my book, Scammer's Yard, and part of the reason why I wrote about criminals, right, as a way of thinking about reparations, is that we can't disqualify people based upon their class base, basis, right? We can't disqualify people who might sit outside of what we think of as the normative, the normative expectations of respectability, right? So if you have an unhoused, homeless, ados person, right, in the Bay Area, we don't need to think about reparations for them solely on the basis of some kind of social programming, right? Let's find that person, you know, shelter, you know what I mean, access to, to food, whatever. Right? We, have to, we have to create a model that is incorporated, that, incorporate, that is inclusive of the full scope of people, right? And so that's part of the challenge. And so, you know, what you saw, what you saw with that testimony was, in fact, perhaps one end, right, of that, of that conversation, right? Which is, well, what we should do, right? What we should do for reparations is we should, you know, attend to, right, what has been told to us is the appropriate models of citizenship 
Yet what reparations should do is in fact allow black people in this country, a those people for the very first time to decide for yourselves what you want your citizenship to be. That is what reparations is, right? That's what to my mind reparations should accomplish. And so that has to happen with, co with conversation and has to happen with community meetings like this, right? And so which is like the work of CJEC and other groups, it's, it's, it's terribly important because these are some really tough conversations that we need to have. And these are the conversations I'm trying to get the task force, I'm hoping to get the task force to, to, to have as well. Because, you know, what I don't want is, you know, reparations as another civil rights act, because we saw what that did. Right? What we don't want is reparations as another, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, because we saw what that did. Reparations has to be more than just a promise, right, of rights. What reparations must do, in my mind, has to put, right, has to put the power of rights making in the hands of Black people. You know, we talk about, I think a brother men, men, mentioned Tulsa, right? Who mentioned Tulsa? Was it, someone mentioned, I think the guy who was oh, yeah, Tulsa, yeah. Right? So some of you know, I mentioned earlier that I've been studying, I've been doing research in Tulsa for the past seven years, right? Before the Watchmen, before everybody started making up, a yes. you know, talking about Tulsa, right? Mm -hmm. So Black Wall Street, right? Greenwood, Negro Wall Street, it is rooted Right or its 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 accomplishment was rooted in a very particular a very particular moment, which was after Reconstruction, when Black folks saw that the first attempt to somehow respond to the issue of slavery, to the crime and injury of slavery, failed, meaning the failure of Reconstruction. Black folks started moving out of the South, right? Moving to Kansas and moving into what is today Oklahoma, but which was then called Indian Territory, right? Indian Territory was not America. It was not US jurisdiction in terms of the geography. It was run by native people. It was open in a particular way. Now, what it allowed was for black folks who showed up in Indian Territory in the 18, late 1880s, right? To develop towns, in their own image and likeness these all black towns and greenwood was effectively an all black town that was created where folks had the banks had the educational system had the churches had everything and these things were determined on their own now to my mind reparations should allow for this kind of autonomy right reparation should not be some kind of what we call effectively a loan Here's something that we know is going to just simply be recirculated back into the mainstream American economy, right? Or let's just invest in this so you become more educated workers so that you can go and then just go work for Amazon, right? And make Jeff Bezos even richer. Right? And so these are the things that I, I have, you know, in my heart, I mean, 20 years of thinking about these questions. Right? In my heart, this is what reparations should at least aspire to accomplish, right? You'll get to where we get to, but this is what we should aspire to accomplish. So, you know, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised by the KFC comment, right? Because there are certain bases by which we understand citizenship and accomplishment and arrival to look like, right? And I'm really happy, you know, for this individual and his family that they were able to accomplish all of these things in life, right? To have the kind of security, right? That somehow black children need to be sent off to boarding schools, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that to me was more harmful than the KFC thing, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. You know? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Lewis. My name is Shanna. Um, awesome. I want to first thank everybody to be here and yourself in the last minute. It really shows a testament to your commitment, not only to this task force, but to the community, community of um, California. So I thank you for being here. Um, one thing I forgot who all said it, maybe it was Kevin. Um, I don't know if it was made clear the criteria of what is an expert witness, um, I need to go back and look at day one and day two. 
many of us who've been collaborating with each other over the past couple of years are due to um, other efforts in this game. So we saw each other's uh, comments. But one of the things that I noticed is, such as uh, Mr. Brooks' comment, we definitely don't want these experts to come in with other agendas. And this looks like the last uh, session that the HR 40 hearings were. And I'm wondering if the expectation is, if you come to this space, it means you are for reparations not to bring in some hidden agenda because now the camera's on you. Now, we can sit here and talk about what did he mean and all this stuff, and as black folks, my thing is use your black scent. So the KFC, yeah, fine. We saw Dave Chappelle, we knew what that was. But the other thing that you stated about the boarding school, that's a whole other thing. We don't put our kids in boarding school. Okay? So there was another, even though it's public, if he's watching it, it is what it is. My thing is called a thing to thing. It was disrespectful. Not only that, your accomplishments are what they are, but I'm going to have to reference of someone who grew up watching Good Times. And it was an episode when you had the bougie family come in because the daughter wanted to go out with JJ and they had their issues. And James Evans Sr. had to tell them that you could not, you don't forget where you came from. We have people like that, unfortunately, in our families and our communities. And whether they're educated or they choose not to be. And maybe this was that case. Maybe he thought it was funny. But it wasn't funny. Because we're talking about it now. And I think the moment of yesterday happened for a reason. And Dr. Lewis, your presence today is here for a reason. Because we need to be able to see that these are real people who have commitment. Not just because they were selected by someone in government just to be on a panel. And then they go off and do what they want to do. And also, it's significant in the bud. And I think the call out collectively, even with the two statesmen, them aligned to what is going on with the DOJ is showing that everybody sees what's happening. Let's nip it in the bud right now. So, as you just attested to earlier, that let's just say we're confident that there's going to be some adjustments and some positive in favor for us come the next meeting. But that's why I was wondering if it was ever stated in the very beginning, whether it was the second meeting, what is the criteria to be an expert witness? Because we absolutely do not want somebody to come in with that level of lack of education. I'm being nice, but I, I could say something else <laughs> to that. And then you have someone chiming in saying, see, I told you. We don't need that. We we in the environment of open enemies, even if they look like us or they come from our lineage. We have to call them out and they keep it moving. We're not going to uh, focus on these people too much because that's what they want us to do. So again, I do thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you for that comment. You know, I and that's you know what I will what I will say, and this might be somewhat controversial, but so be it. You know, is that I think, you know, I, I think that the the witnesses right are symptomatic of a lack of clarity even within the the task force about what what our views are, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is that I know I know I now know less about what the rest of you know my task force members believe reparations are and should accomplish then mr brooks at least i know mr brooks doesn't want y'all folk buying KFC. <laughs> right at least i know that right <laughs> and and you know i think you know the process of how we get witnesses right now is 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 a little opaque right I, again, I made that comment to the DOJ yesterday. I said, listen, you know, how how am I not being asked, you know, <laughs> who should be a witness on environmental racism, right? When that's like literally my job, right? Or part of my job. So, you know, that is a that is a structural issue that I do think that we can absolutely remedy. And it, it seems based upon the very end of the meeting yesterday that we're on our way to remedying it. Right. What I would love is for there to be a system by which 
when a, a series of witnesses, you know, uh, is proposed that we all get to have some say on it before it is finalized and approved, right? Um, that to me is necessary. That does not yet happen, right? I did not know of Mr. Brooks until I saw the agenda, right? Yesterday, one of my colleagues from UC Berkeley, John Powell, was a witness, and I didn't even know he was a witness. Right? <laughs> so you have these things that are that are a structural issue that I do think we can change, right? Um, so you know, so it, it, I, I believe that member holder is on the case, right? And so let's 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 let us wait and see. And I think, you know, again, you know, I'm I'm gonna just keep driving the point home. The community has a voice here, right? The organizations has you know have have a voice here, and you know you need to make them you know you need to make them loud and pronounced, and you need to make sure that we hear, right? So that you know what the, you know the, the truth is that the the task force members are entirely on side, right? As little as I do know, I've been able to to, to glean from the conversation, okay, that no one no one there is in opposition, right? No one there is actively trying to you know I think, you know put any hindrance to what they think is a, a reparations plan that is directly a, 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 a plan that focuses on the Eidos community. So, you know, if there's any anxiety around that, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. That to me is very clear, right? Um, and if you have the Jamaican brother on there saying the same thing, then, then you know what, like, you know, then, 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 then take it, take it seriously, right? Um, but we're going to work on that. And I think, you know, and I think we, we recognize that it's a problem and it is, it is something that we have to fix and we have the powers to fix it. Again, go back to Article 5, right? Go back to Article 5 and, and AB 3121. Apparently, we can dictate the, the compensation of the, of, of the, <laughs> stop causing trouble. But, you know, yes. you know, the task force may appoint and fix the compensation of such personnel as a task force considers appropriate. What does that mean? Right? That there are certain powers that the task force has. And I think we're just learning now what the limits of those powers are. And I think, you know, we're going to see them. You know, member holder talked about subpoena powers. That's a major power, right? And I want us to just kind of focus on, on those real significant powers that we have, right? The fact that we can call up, right, corporations, we can call up state institutions, we can call up people who operate in the state of California. Right, and get some real information. And that is that is actually really important, right? Because what we know is that the injuries are broad. The injuries aren't just this like general kind of abstract notion of, of white supremacy or anti-black racism, right? The injuries were decisions by corporations, by individuals and in corporations that sought in many cases to generate profit at the expense of the black community, right? These are the things that I want us to make sure that we exercise our powers in. Um, that to me is that to me is a priority, and, and that's where I'm going to put my energy and my efforts into making sure that we can actually, you know, have accurate and and robust accounting for the injury, so that way we can have the most accurate and most robust um, basis for reparation and package of reparation. Okay, so I'm going to try to make this one my last uh, question, and it goes back to I think it was yesterday when I called in for the open statement. I was saying that towards the, uh, the conclusion of the task force, I would like to see proposals made for the federal level, our reparations program for the federal level, of course, because the federal government is really the only entity big enough to do the reparations package that I think we are all talking about. But I also think that California, the state, can do some things for its uh, black population, you know, for more immediate relief. Um, and so, I guess one of the, the, the questions that I have is, do you think that with, when, once you guys start writing proposals, you guys are going to include the, the federal level and then the state level, um, things that California could do to help Black people move into asset ownership? And I linked that to a story that I saw um, it was a black woman who owned her own wine bar in Alameda County. Um, and she said that there was 0.1% of people of color in the wine industry in the nation. 
Now, the thing that I failed to mention, is, you know, for Charm, is that she was uh, someone who immigrated to America uh, from Kenya in the 1990s. Now, I don't think that black people have a problem with her being the inventor. The problem is that she's the first to open up a business like that in Alameda County, where black people have been for years. And so, you know, that's horrible. It's not just the metric alone is horrible, 0.1% of the wine industry, but then that it took so long for a black person, you know, immigrant born to be the first. And I would like to see, you know, statewide proposals that people, you know, California could do in order to move the needle along while we're pushing for the federal program. Yeah, th th thank you for that. Um, you know, so, you know, again, in AB 3121, in Article 6, right, it says that any state level reparation actions that are undertaken as a result of this chapter are not a replacement for any reparations enacted at the federal level, right? So at the very least, right, what we know is that this is not going to foreclose a larger claim, right? Um, meaning a federal, a federal claim. Now, you know, what we, what we have the power <laughs> Right. What we have the powers to do is to is to demonstrate, you know, as we saw with the witness testimony, like the fugitive slave uh, laws, etc. Right. To show how the federal the federal government right facilitated state level injury. Right. I mean, that's very clear. And so what that does is opens up a pathway for us to to move towards a kind of federal a federal claims of reparations, or at least to help support the ongoing federal claim of reparations. You know, the, the other thing is, um, you know, what, what is evident is that if you look across the centuries of oppression that, that African-Americans have faced, right, uh, black folks have always, you know, made a way out of no way, right, as the saying goes. And so what we understand racism in this country to do is to, to, to be an inhibitor, right? It has always been primarily a way of getting in the way of black people's development. Again, going back to Tulsa, going back to a lot of the black towns that existed here in California, actually, right? Black folks have always found a way to, to do for themselves and for their community. What we want, you know, and actually Stokely Carmichael, Stokely Carmichael um, in his Black Power Address said, you know, that the Civil Rights Act wasn't for black people, right? And I would, I, would, I would recommend you go back and read, read that, that, that address because what he said was that the Civil Rights Act was to actually tell white people, right, to remind white people that, that black people can do things and can be places, right? So the Civil Rights Act wasn't for, for African Americans, right? Instead, it was for white Americans to inform them of, of black people's humanity and black people's capability. And so the, the, the flip side of that comment is that Black people have never needed the federal government, right, to accomplish anything at a collective level, right, at a community level. Those accomplishments have always been in spite of government, right, have always been in spite of white supremacist uh, racism and violence. So, you know, what we want, you know, what we want is to think about, well, how do you, on one hand, make sure, right, the when we talk about the non-repetition, right, the, you know, the removal of these, 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 these formal policy-based blockages, right, once you take that away and then you provide the African-American community with two things, right, you take that away, you provide the African-American community with the fully endowed citizenship of an American citizenship, right, meaning the rights of an American citizen, and then you provide reparations, then on the basis of that alone, in my personal belief, that should be what is necessary because black folk have always demonstrated the will, the industry, right? And the mindset for development and growth. So you don't need a policy that's going to help you grow. What you need is a policy that doesn't stop you from growing because that's what racist policies have always been in this country when it comes to black people. What we need, and we go back to we go back to Indian Territory, we go back to Tulsa, right? <clears throat> you can go back. You can go back to post-emancipation in this country, 
right? And this was referenced in a couple of the witness statements over these past couple of days, that what black folk wanted after slavery was land and to be left alone, right? Land, tools, and autonomy, right? And they said they would do the rest. And I think that still applies, right? Now, what land and tools and so forth looks like, it looks like reparations. It looks like capital, right? It looks like capital and the absence of any kind of further hindrance to the Black community's ability, the African American communities to, to have self-development, right? That, that to me is what's necessary. Which would be protected class citizenship. Protected yep. class citizenship. Who, who's saying that? Is that Kevin in the back? Yeah. Kevin. <laughs> I really wish I was there, but I'm coughing and stuff, and so I'm, I'm worried. You know what I mean? So let me just let this one go. So go ahead, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was saying uh, protected class uh, citizenship on a state level and a federal level. Right. Yeah, I agree you with that. You want the same protection as a bald eagle. <laughs> is, there another, is there another comment? I heard someone say something else. Anybody else? I think that's where AB 105 will probably come in handy. Well, will be in handy because it's going to. Sorry. So I said, I think that's where AB 105 will come in handy because now it's. You cannot deny the data there. It's not us talking opinions if we're talking facts and history here and so what kevin was saying i think that all this stuff is interconnected right nothing is working by itself by silo all these different components is what we're us gathering together as part of this too right but i think that's going to play into that because now you're going to say you can't continue to aggregate this group of what you call black the term black was for this country you don't go to the continent and they don't call themselves black. It's only when they're in the face of Western American people is when they may say that. It is ethnic groups within yeah. that tribe, within nation. We don't do that here because we didn't have that conditioning. We're now learning to do that and we have more reason to do that now and we should be proud of that. But I believe once Gavin gets his pencil and do what he need to do because let's be honest you could have been recalled let's be honest you could have been recalled our elders or whoever we know what happened with Ray Davis and we got Arnold and look what happened so Arnold need to take this as you better do what you need to do yeah that other white do that yes other white do <laughs> that's, that's a really important point, you know what I mean, and that's why 105 is really is really important, right? I mean, because we just waiting for another. Let's do the Zoom meeting like we did last time on September 30th. We don't need another Zoom meeting where you can have this before the final, and then we'll right. talk about it later. But that's an important point, you know, because you know if we think about if we think about the various independence movements, you know, post-emancipation, think about Haiti, right? So Haiti in, in, in 1801, right? The, 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 <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little here, but <clears throat> they had to identify themselves as a nation that was distinct from other nations. When you're thinking about Jamaican independence, Jamaica is a primarily but not exclusively black country, right? Black Jamaicans, Afro Jamaicans had to understand themselves as a discrete category, right? Discrete from black people in America, Haiti, etc. Now, to my mind, that has to happen in a legal way in the United States as well. Now, there is a manipulation that is allowed for by aggregating black people, right? Aggregating any group is always seen as, you know, being done for some form of advantage, but the question is advantageous for whom, right? We, understand, we know that whiteness, right, as a category that is, you know, related to blackness is really an exclusive category. Right, that is policed. People become white, 
right? Groups have over the centuries in Western Europe, as well as North America, been allowed to enter into whiteness. It was never a foregone conclusion about who qualified as white, right? And this is why to this very day, you have people say, I'm Italian American or I'm, uh, you know, uh, Irish American. Mm -hmm. Because historically, those communities, right, are relatively recent additions to the white party, right? Yet you will never hear somebody who is of, you know, British origin in America, a white person of, of British origin say, I'm British American. That means something very different, doesn't it? Because that is the primary model, right? The primary you know, basis for inclusion into whiteness. Now with blackness, we don't have that same kind of mechanism, right? Everybody based upon complexion, phenotype, whatever is just already and always assumed to be a part of this collective. But what we know is that there are tensions within that collective that need to be, you know, kind of worked out through a form of disaggregation. Because you're right, Right? When you go to the continent, people are Igbo, Fulani, etc., etc., etc. They may be put together in a nationalist identity like Nigeria, right? But that is separate from their ethnic identity, which is Igbo or Yoruba. That is also then separate from a racial identity, which may be Black, right? So you can have a Nigerian who, in fact, has three bases for self-identification, right? Black, as based upon, uh, based upon this kind of global kind of like circulation of racial identification, right? Nigerian, which is a nationalist identification, and then Igbo, Fulani, Yoruba, what have you, which is an ethnic designation. Now, in this country, we don't afford that same, that same complexity to blackness, and we need to. Right. Um, and what we have to understand is that 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 aggregation of blackness in this country has been or was for the explicit purpose of exploitation. Right. To collapse, to collapse people into one singular category, made that category more easy to control, in other words, easier to manipulate, easier to exploit. Because let's not remember that we only recently over the past couple hundred years have been, you know, not even a couple hundred years, I'm sorry, right? Less than a couple hundred years have been fighting to actually gain back the full notion of humanity, right? So, you know, these are, these are real and historical, you know, acts and practices of manipulating the group individual qualification of black people and i think in order for us to again have a very clear distinction and have a, a very clear and necessary accounting of both injury and reparations we have to actually do this work of you know specifying and particularizing who we're talking about and when we're talking about them that that that's, has to be done and that is not me saying that as you know as making a political statement that is as to say if we're going to actually do the work that we need to do we actually have to have that that granularity that needs to be there back, back, back a little bit back. so we got i think we got one more from one 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 more person they want to let you go because um definitely appreciate your time and uh and if you're you know um, no we, we definitely appreciate your time so um you know what I can I can hear, yeah. First of all, thank you for coming. Really appreciate you. Um, usually the person behind the camera and the mic usually do production, but since this is our production, we can do it no more. <laughs> so first of all, uh, Kim, myself, and another sister named Kendall and Ivana. Uh, we went out to the community and collected a couple of interviews. And we actually sent those to the DOJ. Now, what I did, because I'm a video editor, I actually edited the, um, both the video and the audio under three minutes, right? Because we're in public comments. One of the best requirements is that you know, you only get three minutes to speak during public comments. Um, I think one of the issues I think everybody keeps reiterating, in which I, as myself, is concerned with the DOJ is that actually the information 
is not going to task. Now, um, I believe it was September 23rd when you guys um, had the public comments. It was actually a period where I felt like maybe if you guys did receive these testimonials that you actually went out to the community to get, that it could have actually been played during that time. Now, obviously, it would have been up to the task force to, mm. to say, hey, we want these played or not played. I mean, that's up to you guys. But we, I guess we as the concerned public and community, we just want to know if you guys are getting this information, and if you're not, if there's some kind of accountability behind it. So that's my question. Okay. <clears throat> That makes sense. No, it makes sense. So we we get the information, but you know my 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 question is about the timing of the information and how we can use that in implementing a plan and a strategy. You know, so that's that's the that's the issue. Is so we can get information, right? Let's say we get the information. Even you know, the, the thing has been that we've been we've been having you know. <clears throat> The spacing of the meetings hasn't been quite regular, right? Now, what we need is information in a timely manner, right? Which is, I'm assuming, you know, being 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 sympathetic to the DO, DOJ staff, right? At what point do you cut off the information that you want to pass along to the task force, right? But what I think we need to work out is, well, what is a timeline by which we could both have the information with enough advanced time ahead of the meeting and to have a mechanism of actually discussing what comes up in, the, in, in, in that packet? Because basically a long, you know, we get a long PDF of all of the kind of voicemails being transcribed and so forth. So I haven't seen a video. No one has sent me a video, right, for example. Um, but what I want to see if we can figure out is how do we get that information and then have an opportunity to kind of respond to that information in time so that it can show up in the following meeting. That's the problem, right? That I think is the challenge. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'm, 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 I, will, I will send an email today about <clears throat> because that, that is something that we need to kind of figure out. And, and thank you for that uh, response. And I just mentioned that because when we go out to the community, nobody knows about AB 3121. Nobody knows about the task force. Nobody knows about you know the nine individuals like yourself, who are phenomenal people. And I can say this for a fact: we're out in the community, and nobody knows about this. Right. They, they straight up don't. We're like, hey, you guys know about AB 3121? No. These are regular black folks on, on the street, so it's very disturbing. So hopefully. The um, proposal sent by Dr. Grill will be implemented, and you know we can try to turn this thing in a more positive direction. Because right now it's a business. So yeah, I mean that's so. Right now we're waiting. You know, right now the the community engagement plan is is at the heart of what of what we're hoping. You know, will shift will shift everything in terms of what the task force can do. Um, as far as getting community feedback and actually responding to it in a meaningful way. Because uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I don't want for us to come up with a reparations plan in a vacuum, right? Nine people, likely over Zoom, right? Or not Zoom, that blue jeans thing, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that to me is the wrong way to go about it. And I hope, and I hope that we can actually have a very robust community engagement plan. You know, I hope that, you know, community organizations like those, you know, in the room today and putting on this event can, can push, right, and, and, and ideally can be incorporated within some of those anchor groups, right? And so, you know, my hope is, you know, so CJEC needs to be an anchor group, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's kind of common sense right it's, it's, it's really it's really obvious and so and so we'll see but i you know again it, the badly keen thing is really is really is really restrictive um you know having to kind of show up and have a conversation take in witness testimony decide on things and then plan the next agenda 
isn't really conducive to, you know, to real to real problem solving, right? Um, and 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 that's and that's a and that's a real problem. So so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm gonna work on it. I, I know that uh, I know that Camila's working on it. I know that Lisa Holt is working on it. I know that um, Dr. Cheryl Griffith is working on it. Um, so I, I think I think we should hopefully start seeing some 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 changes in how things are done. Hopefully by next meeting, because next meeting we're going to be almost at the halfway mark of our meetings, aren't we? So, yeah. um, and, I mean, that's kind of frightening, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to show up at things like this. So please, you know, like, let me know, right? Those folks who are listening and who are, you know, in Southern California, um, reach out to those. I mean, and the majority of the task force is based in Southern California, yeah. right? <laughs> And I don't, I don't know, right? I, you know, and, and that's why I asked the question around, you know, the community engagement plan and the bond center. Um, they sound like they're really great, but I don't want there to be, you know, a neglect of the rest of the state, right? Um, and so it's important that it's important that Southern California groups really press to to be represented in that community engagement plan. But also, I want to make sure that Northern Californian groups. Um, are equally are equally represented and that's and that's going to be you know really the partnership right between between myself dr amos brown and don tamaki who's also who's also really on side right at, you know is a east bay resident right could show up at events so reach out right and invite us to these things you basically took the words out of my mouth as a, a member of groups that are planning on more community outreach events and i'm definitely thankful i know that you are on board for participating in these community events i just want to um i know you can't speak for the other members but i wonder if we do have these community engagements how would the best outreach be to maybe request or ask members of the commission to maybe to participate and you know put forth their valuable information at our community events because it was sparse i think members of the community to say, oh, this commission is really engaged, they're showing up at our community events. Mm -hmm. And also to do the education part, because as the judge president said before, a lot of regular people don't really know about reparations yet, which is very important for the community engagement. But I'm wondering if the commission would be willing to participate in those uh, community outreach events and how perhaps could we best facilitate that? So what I'll say is this, I, I am here today, one, because I heard, you know, I heard about this meeting yes, in yesterday's meeting and I was like, oh, it's in Oakland. I can go to that. Right. Um, but also because, you know, a guy named Chris sent me an email <laughs> right over the summer. You know what I mean? And then Tiffany followed up. Right. And, and, and you know, the point is that we're human beings, right? We can talk, we can meet. Right? <laughs> Bagley King doesn't prevent us from being a part of the community, right? From working with the community. So, you know, all I will say is that, you know, without giving a, a, a you know, a formal prescription for what I think you should do, I can just, I, I can just tell you how and why I'm here today, right? Um, Chris emailed me, Tiffany followed up and I'm here, right? And so I think, you know, I, I think, you know, similar success will be found with, with other task force members, right? That's my, that's my, that's my assumption. Um, you know, so the community engagement thing, you know, so can you clarify? So are you asking about um, how, how we can reach out to the community? Is that, is that a part of what you're saying? Or did I kind of respond to your question already? You did respond to my question, but what it is, I am a member of, uh, I'll say, the political arm of our uh, church, and we have been doing virtual town halls around the election and other, you know, things that are important to the community. So we were have definitely decided that we will do a town hall on reparations. So okay. Just, that is how I was looking at it, so just that we could reach out to some of those commission members that would you know, add more credibility to our outreach and maybe attract more people and educate more people. Yeah, yes, by all by all means, right? By all means. And and what I will say also is that 
Um, you know, Chris, I don't know, you know, if, you know, so it seems like something is happening um, with Alameda County. I know something is happening with the city of Berkeley. You yep. know, so there, there are these, you know, so there's a state, there's a, there's our task force, but I do know at various levels um, of yeah. the state, you know, the county and various cities, there are, you know, San Francisco, as you know. LA, so, like, you know yeah. so even outside of these formal reparations task forces, you know, different different levels of government are actively thinking about this question because of the California task force. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you are already in touch, but I would also encourage you to get in touch with your local officials, right? Um, and, and the various local and, 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 and you know, county and city level governments, because I, I know that they are thinking about these questions and are beginning to try and plan and organize. And some of them, you know, I, I'm not really sure how much community involvement there already is. Um, and so these are also really important stages or, or rather levels for you to, to, to kind of reach out to and, and, and mobilize as well. And just to say real quick to you, Carol, um, so what's, what's the name of the church, by the way? Uh, Allen Temple Baptist Church. So it's, it's Allen Temple Baptist Church. Right? Mm -hmm. so, and that's in, that's in East, that's in East right Street. Yeah. It is. Um, and the, so I just want to make sure that we got the name on, on record so that we uh, Dr. Lewis can know what it is. And also, uh, one of the folks in the chat right now, probably, probably Jones, Council Muhammad, um, is a commissioner for the LA a city reparations task force. So the city of LA created its own reparations task force. Uh, I believe the city of San Francisco did the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, they got a committee. Right. They got a committee. Right. So these are also places and people to be invited to these same type of community meetings. So um, thank you for that yeah. recommendation, Dr. Uh, Lewis. Uh, I do want to, we are running on, uh, you know, we are. Over time, but I think we're not over time. I think we we are having the conversation that we need to have, right? Yeah. Um, but I do want to respect your time and also your your health, brother, um, and also your your family too. So, um, if there are no more questions, no more comments, um, I think we can wrap here. Am I cool? Yes. Okay, cool. So my uh, my DJs are telling me that uh, we can wrap here, uh, brother. Why don't can we give the brother a round of applause? Everybody in here is sitting in history right now. Everybody. Everybody here is inside of a history book right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. May not feel like it, may not know it yet. Okay. But at some point in time, they're gonna be writing and talking in the in the textbooks about what black folks was doing right now. And you are literally here. So give yourselves you know, give you uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been my honor, really. Um, I mean, this is the work, you know, this is the work. And that's all I'll say about it, right? Um, but please don't, don't, you know, and anybody is very welcome to reach out to me, right? I have a very easy email address, my first name at berkeley.edu. All right. All right. Thank you again for having me. Chris, everybody, right. take care. Bye. Bye. Right, so we want to thank y'all here, here too. Y'all stay like an hour almost later, right? And talk about black stuff. So, yes. What the fuck is, um, when you was talking about that, um, they don't have any information beforehand about the witnesses coming. Um, did that happen with Dr. Hamilton, who was the consideration, I guess, now is the economic advisor? Sounds I mean, because like it seemed like only Dr. Grills knew about who he was. I mean, they're not working in China. So it sounds like it sounds like they that's a part of the issue that one, they're not getting the information. Some of the information it sounds like that they're not getting at all, which is a problem. Thank you. I want to respect this. Yeah. While he said that the DOJ doesn't have a veto power, it does sound like they're doing like it sounds like they are they are acting like they have a veto power, yeah. Um, and that's a problem. Um, and then it, it also kind of sounds like so once they get the information, they kind of explain it. I don't know how they 
and then they cut it on a PDF, yeah, and then they yeah. send it to them, but they get it when they do, right? It's so we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the exact answer. We asked this, we, 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 so I think back with the California Department of Justice, we asked them, is, are they getting the stuff we send them? They said, yes, they're getting them, but, well, one, we know that's not 100% true right now. I just know that's not 100% true. They went out and asked community members, they got video testimony from elders talking about they, how they got to California and why they came to California. They didn't get those, so that's, that's not true, right? So that's not true. But what they are getting, they're only getting very close to the meeting. So they get everything that everybody's saying, maybe like four or five days. That was the number that was put to, to be four or five days before their meeting. There's no way you can go through all that information in, in four or five days. I mean, you got two months worth of public comments, people emailing, people calling, people, I mean, putting in work, you know, I mean, videos, audio, emails, surveys, forms, two months of that from probably you know, 100,000 people. You got five days to, to, to go through that and then make a decision or use it. So, um, Get so Nancy, what question is no. Um, you know we're still live. Yeah, but I was going to say something. So I mean, even if they didn't have the ability or capabilities um, with the uh, platform that they're using to run videos, the videos that we sent over, we also sent over the migration stories that that um, CJAC had been collected. So I'm thinking, I mean, and maybe this needs just to be coordinated with the, the task force members, but when there was that downtime during public comments, I mean, they could have even Perfect. just read some of the, the comments that you, they, there were some good comments yeah. that could have been read to the um, public during that time. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there was, there was, so I, I know we sent in 15 great migration stories that we have folks say, you know, of, you know email. Um, and yeah, they they're not getting them, in, and then and then and they're not they're not getting in time. That's a big problem. Is there more than one person collecting all this information? Supposedly, there there's a there's a team of folks who who are on it. So the representative you saw there, I would say her name is Sarah Belton. That's the that's that's one one. that was on the live uh, yesterday, and then there are a couple other folks that are working with them. Um, so they have a small team on, it, yeah. Well, um, the other day when I went on the actual website, I actually saw one migration story, just one. But I saw some other emails, so I don't. If I could see them, I'm sure the task force has seen them. But do they have time? Is the right? Yeah, it's are the they time. getting them in and time? Well, that's just somebody right. directing them to even do something, right? It's like you don't know something to them like someone's telling you, and especially all these people actively working or whatever they need to do it. I, again, the representative that was on camera and her crew, whether the intent is this is what your job is and everybody else don't know what their job is, it's, I'm sorry, it's clear to me something is done intentionally. Whether they understand whether they are the doers, meaning someone giving them direction, or they're the ones saying we're not going to do this because they told us just have free reign. There has to be an accountability there. Obviously, yesterday highlighted that accountability, and it's going to we'll see what happens. But for you to send information to other people and have it not be, oh, we got it, yeah, but I don't have to do anything with it, and that's what it sounds like. Yeah, so that is so. Job number one right now for me is to help fix this problem. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Well, yeah, so I was just saying, so for solutions that we can apply moving forward, um, do we want to continue trusting, you know, just sending the information straight to the DOJ, or is this something where we can probably, like, link in an email to one of the commissioners, or is that allowed, or we can add one or two people onto the link Thank from you. the actual commission, so, so that we know that, hey, there's nothing else, we don't have the DOJ got it, but they got it too. So yeah, so that's absolutely right. So um, that was a recommendation. So we asked, so we met with the chair of the task force also. All right, bro, thank you, bro, appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you next time, Bye. Bye. So we met with the chair also, uh, and her, and we relayed these concerns. Like one, what, we give all this, we doing all this community engagement work, giving to y'all, but y'all not giving it. So 
she recommended that we also CC her on on the submission to the to the DOJ. So we're we're doing that too, right? Um, and we're happy to do it with the other council members too. But to be honest with you, um, Harvey wants to say no. I can be honest. Harvey wants to say no. Like we busted our bus to get a law passed, and now we have an organization whose job it is to do this. I don't want to also have to then do their job too, right? Like we didn't fight. That's our history. That's our story. We only got to have a workaround. We got to, like, no, now is the time to actually say, you organization, you institution, you have a job to do, do it. Don't treat us differently. I don't want to have to do, don't, we always tell ourselves we got to do three and four and five times and more than what white folks do. And they're considered I'm done with that. Public report the employees. They're not private. They, these are public, we pay, so we, we pay these salaries. They work for us. Okay. They, these are these are department of justice employees, okay? Um, and they have a job. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to CC folks and make sure that everybody gets it. But to be honest with you, we have to confront this and we have to demand that we get the same respect that everybody else did not. Everybody else gotta CC all of their task force and then also send it to the people who supposed to send it to the task force. I'm not doing that, sorry, okay? Um, we're gonna have this fight. Let's have this fight. Let's win this fight, and then let's move on. That's it. That's my own own thinking. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to ask: um, getting the task force appoint someone because they're they're going to hire staff, right? Oh yeah. So aren't they uh, are they able to actually hire someone who they would have keep and you know keep in like the DOJ yeah. check? <coughs> absolutely. The system. And they can do it themselves too. But absolutely, yeah. they can have somebody. Absolutely. And they they also have the power. Dr. 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 Lewis mentioned that they have the power to set. The salary and pay of the people who are supposed to work for them. That includes potentially DOJ members. Okay. okay. So <laughs> listen, we 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 fought way too hard to create this history to have this happen to us. It's not going to happen to us. We are not going to be. Um, you going to put it back up? Well, she was saying that she wanted to be. The so, so this is okay. So I believe this is the chair of the California Reparations Task Force. Okay, this is Camilla. Camilla Moore. Okay, oh, okay. I believe so, right? I believe that's. I believe that's Camilla. Camilla, that's you. Oh, no, this no, it's not you. Say, um, I told yes. I told staff I will be <laughs> offering my greatest stories in public time of period. They respond that it would take that it will look unfair, or as the communities that have direct access to me have paper. Okay, so. Well, you just heard right here. The chief. So you, what you heard is that the chair of the task force. Right, said to the DOJ that she that she would read the comments during the public comment period, and they told her basically no. Okay, unacceptable. Like no, 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 no. This is I don't want to have a so hold myself DOJ, here, but no, <laughs> no. Chris, let me ask you this: So the DOJ supposed to be a neutral yes. party here, but yet they are biased. They have clearly shown. So one, how can you be neutral and therefore practice by practice? I'm sorry. That's the question. That's the, that is, that is, that is the question. And that is the question that we have in this. Um, you can believe it, we are not letting this go. Yes. Dr. Lewis, he kept referencing um, the Article 5, Section B. The task force should have the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Department of Justice. So that means they are working for us. Why? So I mean, so I mean I'm not understanding something here. I don't understand it. Yeah, so I mean, he kept I mean, referencing, and so I said, well, that means that they work for us. So why are they video, video, I mean, veto? Everything chat Saturday. This is not working. Yeah, it, yeah. It, this 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 is not. So I'm glad we're having this fight actually. To be honest with you, because um, we need to have it. You know, um, well, we need and to have so it. we're not here to play. Because they see other people who look like us like to be in front of cameras with other efforts, and they get their little business or whatever else. They don't see the community driving this. That's how they want those kind of communities, whatever. And now we are, and they don't know what to do with it. So then you want to throw in all these little jabs just to put us off filter, and we're not. Not yet. We are. 
So we're gonna wrap, right? But make sure y'all are on the email list then, okay? Um, on the contact list because um, there will be movement around this DOJ issue mm -hmm. uh, very soon, okay? And I'm, when, I, when I mean soon, I mean before the next meetings, before the October meetings. Um, yeah, because you said yeah. that's the halfway point, but pretty much the halfway it's, point. It's right? technically, it, it could be thought about the halfway point, even though um, we will have a, those wow. listening sessions, and they can meet more than 10 times yeah. if, they, if they want to. They just can't be paid more than 10 times. So they can meet. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure if they have not had any paid meetings yet, because these are all Zoom. So I think technically they could still have 10 paid meetings left, because these meetings aren't these are, oh, so these are like, like reimbursed okay. meetings. Yeah, so like, okay. like these are these are meetings where you have to be like reimbursed for travel, right. going somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the payment is for. But all the meetings have been virtual. So we haven't spent a dime really, I think. So for the outro music, three, 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 what, what did you have? Meeting three. Three. Uh, uh, all meetings are going to be two days. Right. Okay. Like, like, you want to do that one again? Yeah. No, I don't care. For one meeting, they just. They I mean, we can. Oh, it doesn't have a No, never mind. Okay, just do the regular one. Yes. Why? Because it so, doesn't have uh, we, we the kept out way longer than we were like, supposed to. Subscribe, so uh, I appreciate y'all, okay, but it was well worth the time. Okay. Um, thank y'all. Um, I think we are good. But let me, can we give the team a round of applause here for holding us down? Shout out to the staff. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, next time, you. family.